I used to be a very, very private person and not talk about myself at all. And if okay. people ask me certain personal subjects, I just change the subject. Um, okay. And then I realized I was, I was working as a teacher and I was teaching young people and we were talking about mental health and honesty and, and being open. And, I, you know, we were talking about these amazing role models in celebrities and how great it was that they were talking about things. And I was like, hang on, I'm being really hypocritical because I'm not talking to these kids about my own mental health issues or my own, um, you know, medical issues or, um, mm. and then I kind of realized I'm not, I was, I was hiding a lot of what I was going through and what I was suffering from. And I was like, people just think I'm this strong, capable person. And actually maybe it will help one person if they realize that I had this diagnosis or yeah. um, I went through this tough time. And then it was really powerful because as soon as I did that, I started working in um, youth counseling. And when people realize that you've gone through something and you're this badass, they're like, wait, I can still do that. Um, oh, and cool. you know, I've, I've had more than enough emails or letters or cards from young people saying, thank you so much for opening up. Um, and that allowed them to feel, you know, they realize everybody's only human and that kind of thing. Um, mm. That I was like, okay, this is, so now I, I'm the opposite and you can't shut me up. I talk about all kinds of, I'm at a dinner party. And I'm like, let me tell you about my ovaries. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> because you think it's important. We should all be, you know, we should all be open to talking about all the kinds of, especially in the UK, mm. British people are so reserved. <laughs> and there's no wonder especially men as well in the uk young boys i've worked with and male friends of mine that can't they find it so hard to talk about their emotions um or their or their testicular health mm -hmm. why not you know we should all be talking about these kind of things so okay. yes yeah, so, and so for me it's kind of no no topic is too taboo cool sounds good <laughs>no, thank you. It's good that you're looking up for all the plastic free stuff. That's what we need. Yeah, it's a, it's a big thing and you and we'll get to that later on and you've got some sure. you've had some incre incredible stories around uh, around plastics and the work that you're mm. doing. So, but uh, before we get there, uh, you you actually grew up in the UK reading Nat Geo magazines uh, to parents who really encouraged exploration in your life and uh, you really took that on board. And uh, so tell us a bit about their parenting and their parenting style. And what kind of influence they they sort mm. of had on you and have on you? Absolutely, it's um, uh, I owe everything I am to my mother, um, who raised me, and she is an incredible woman. She's um, a real force of nature, um, but very very gentle. So a lot of people meet her, and she's very calm and very quiet. But behind that, she, you know, she gave me the world. Um, and anything I, if I said, oh, I want to be an astronaut, she'd start stitching a, you know cosmonaut suit or whatever it was um she she has this attitude of just go out and do it um and when i told her i was thinking of maybe moving to borneo for two years she was like cool brilliant when do you go let's let's get you some luggage um so she she always encouraged me to travel um i she my mum in the 70s as a teenager went traveling by herself um all over the world and she would go on holiday to Jamaica for three months as a teenager. You know, this was at a time when people in the UK maybe went to the south of Spain for a week as an <laughs> annual holiday. You know, it was it was a very different time. And in the, in the 60s and 70s, my mum, as a solo female traveler, would just be off all over the world. And she just wanted to see the world. So I grew up with her stories of palm trees and turquoise blue water and white sand and the tropics and the birds and the colors. Mm. We had Caribbean music, we had Caribbean food um, and, and South American chili. My mum does, does an amazing chili and I'm growing up in like small like farm town on the Isle of Wight and my friends come over and my mum's serving them, you know, Mexican chili, which I, I kind of love. Um, so so I, I kind of grew up in a, with, with a very international um, flavor in my household and uh, we had 
you know, masks all over the walls and weird furniture, carved wooden furniture from mm. goodness knows where. Half of it, I still don't even know where it's from. Um, and trinkets and things from, you know, dried stuffed piranhas. So it's like, oh yeah, that's from <laughs> when I was in the Amazon. Um, and it's kind of cool because I, without realizing, have become the same. Um, and I kind of love it because I feel like I'm carrying the torch for, for my mum, carrying on that, that, that same sort of tradition. Um, but the other thing that she did as well was always had um, like foreign exchange students coming to stay with us, um, which she did to get a bit of extra money because she was a single mother. Um, and it's a good way to be able to stay at home and look after your children and not have to go into an office. So she was able to look after us and then host students. Um, this is obviously way before Airbnb or any of that kind of concept. So we always had random international people in the house with us. Mm. And when I was little, I would learn all these random languages. We'd have, you know, a Japanese boy and a German girl and someone from Ethiopia. And we had all these people from different backgrounds, different shapes, sizes, colors, races, genders, sexualities, all in, the, you know, in the house, talking to us, telling us stories. My favorite thing was, when I was little to jump up with my atlas and get my atlas out and be like, where, where did you come from? <laughs> you know? Sometimes it'd arrive in the night because I go to bed, I was a child. So I'd you know, go to bed early and then I'd wake up and there'd be like a Japanese man at the breakfast table. Wow. And I was like, cool, <laughs> where's this guy from? You know, and, and, and what's his life and what food does he eat? And we'd talk and sometimes the English was not good and I'd try and talk to them. So I learned as a little child how to communicate with somebody who has nothing in common with you um, and how to appreciate the different cultures and to come at things from a totally different perspective. Um, and for that, I am forever grateful because that's given me a love of international community and the idea that your door is always open and that you can host anybody. And I've always traveled the world staying with guest families and host families. And I have, you know, a thousand families all over the world that I can stay with. and it's a very different way of traveling. I'd never stay in a hotel. I don't see how you're visiting that place if you're staying in a hotel and detaching yourself from it. Mm. Um, you know, I like to be in the community with the local people and get them to show me around rather than looking in a guidebook. Um, mm. So I've, I haven't done, I haven't seen a lot of the famous, you know, landmarks or tourist d destinations in the world, but I've seen all these random towns and villages where people actually live and I've just kind of existed with them for several months at a time. Um, so yeah, I, I owe all of that to my mum, actually. Mm. She's, she was pretty amazing. And she was a really, she's, she's a really good photographer as well. So that always instilled in me a bit of a visual eye, um, which I guess was the, the early stage of the, the filmmaking for me, um, mm. because she, she would always be pointing out, I was, I was um, you know, quite smart as a kid and, would get bored easily so she constantly had to be say, asking me questions and saying look at that and what's this and how many birds are there and what color is that tree and just constantly quizzing me so that I would just be soaking up information around the world around everything I was looking at so that allowed me to have a very visual eye that I can spot and observe and notice interactions and I guess perspective and lines and things my mum is is an artist and she works um as a as a designer and architect and so she's really creative um and i guess it's that combination of like seeing the world differently and not being afraid of the world hmm. yeah there's there's something special and precious i think about being brought up with a curious mind and um that's uh, that's something that we should all try like instill in our kids more and more because uh, i think we we kind of need that in this day and age mm -hmm. um, and it looks like just looking at the back of the wall there i'm not sure are you, are you at your mom's house now or are you at your own place no this is my house and, and yeah. so the, the tradition oh, no. has carried on you've, you've, yeah. you've got all the things on the walls see. as well yeah, I've got my antique map collection, which you can't see, but I've got masks, I've got this spears. A lot, a lot of people give me weapons, I guess, because I'm like a solo female traveler. And I, I stay in the jungle in, like, in Papua New Guinea. I was living with this tribe for a few months. And when I left, they just literally loaded me up with weapons. All the different people were like, you need these spears. Look after you yourself. Bows and, arrows. and I was like covered from head to toe with shields and drums and, and wow. weapons and stuff. So um, I got some big machetes that scare people off um, wow. yeah and it's great because i do now i kind of 
you know when you get to a certain age i don't know if you guys have got to that stage yet where you kind of recognize mannerisms that were your parents and you're like oh i've oh, yeah. become my become my father or i've become my mother <laughs> um and i'm the same when when people come in and they my house is called the museum people were like oh we'll go to ellie's and look at some of the museum pieces and they'll go tell us about this this headdress or tell us about this spear oh, wow. and then i tell the story and it's the same as when i was little when i was a little girl and i used to ask my mum, where did this you know weird carved bowl come from and she would tell the story <laughs> so in a way it's that the same thing i was talking about this this book i've been reading about the women who run with wolves which mm. is all about myth and legend that's passed down through the the matriarchy kind of um, lineage i guess it's the same sort of thing yeah so um, yeah yeah it's so cool i mean i can imagine you must have some amazing stories before before we started the podcast you're telling us about some of your adventures and i was like wow <laughs> you definitely have some good campfire stories to tell so yeah. um but like i guess these days like what actually attracts you know attracts you to adventures so much because you you're constantly on the road aren't you yeah it's a good question um i guess it's it's two things from a from a personal point of view just in terms of my own motivation um just a very minor percentage of it is this desire to see i just want to see everything it's that same curiosity um my i remember very vividly my first nightmare uh, you know i kind of recognized as a nightmare i was probably four years old um and i woke up because i realized even if i left tomorrow and i started traveling i could i wouldn't actually see everywhere in the world in my life mm. I real when I realized the world was bigger than I like little four year old me, um, that terrified me. <laughs> so I guess I've been kind of like running around trying to see as much as I can. Um, but then I slowed I've slowed right down and realized actually spending time in places with the right people and communities and that, that's what life is rather than just kind of I've never been somebody to check off. You know I've been to fifty eight countries or whatever, um, mm. it, but still I kind of I have this. I have this, I'm not drawn to new places. I'm drawn to somewhere that's totally different because I always love that, you know, who's going to be at the breakfast table tomorrow mm. morning. I guess now it's kind of which, which flight am I going to be on next? Which, which, you know, country am I going to step into next week or next month or next year? Um, so I do like that, that pull. But for me, in terms of career and in terms of what I want to do and the impact that I want to have, it's about finding the stories that matter and telling uh, giving a voice to people whose voices are not being heard and um, allowing everybody else, other people in the Western world, um, in the UK and in the US where I've worked mostly, um, to have that same experience that I did because I see a lot of fear and a lot of, un, a lot of um, stereotype and assumptions and kind of, um, yeah, I guess barriers to understanding what else is out there and people do tend mm. to stick to themselves or stay with their own kind i get a lot of people say oh don't go there it's dangerous it's like mm. london is as dangerous if not more dangerous than anywhere else you're just as likely to get in trouble in the street just here than you know in borneo or papua new guinea or wherever um so i kind of want to bring the stories from around the world to the audiences who haven't had the chance that the privilege that I had them um, to go and see them for themselves um, and to try and break down some of those boundaries between mm. between us all mm. that's really amazing yeah it's extremely so, yeah yeah so it's just I just think that's so important like you mm. know what I mean um like you said people kind of make up their minds about places or about people yeah. and what they like and they 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 also never get a chance to kind of reflect on their own sort of like yeah. uh, you know where you know their, their own upbringing and where they live and these sort of things and they, they often think that it's bad where they live and things like that but they mm -hmm. haven't been to other places and seen yeah. okay yeah it's really bad do you know what i mean absolutely like, yeah and i think i think, I think that's that's, that's the other thing the perspective because and i'm the same i'm guilty of it as well i think london for me is has been the worst city for that because i've lived all over and this is london is the first city that i've lived i say i've lived here i spent three nights here last year but um mm -hmm. the time that i spend in london i kind of I, I moved here and i was like right i'm not going to get sucked into the whole kind of metropolitan you know how much money do you earn and do you wear designer clothes i'm not i'm not remotely interested in that but you still get sucked into worrying and fretting about 
pointless things and coming home and going, oh, I've had the worst day. Oh my gosh, I'm so stressed. And people just build this kind of anxiety and this stress in the city of thinking that their day is the worst and their life is the worst and it's so unfair and why can't I? And then, and I, I am guilty of that. I have sat here and ranted about, you know, how frustrated I am about a situation. And the good thing for me is that within 24 hours or within a few days, I'm on a plane and I'm in somewhere else that mm. I kind of go, oh, oh yeah, no, that doesn't matter at all. My life is amazing. And, you know, like people have real problems, you know, so yeah. the, the so whole right. like hashtag first world problems is something that yeah. I think we're all, all susceptible to kind of slide into very easily. And of course, I'm not uh, downplaying. People have real hardship um, here as well. Yes. And a tough day for somebody is a tough day, regardless of, you know, you don't have to be a starving child in a third world country to be having a, d- a tough day. I totally understand that. And as I said at the beginning about mental health in the UK, it is important that we are all discussing that. But I think um, I think it's important to recognise our privilege and how wonderful this gift is that we have life and health and the ability to travel. And some people don't even have that. So um, that perspective as well is, is really interesting. And the other way, because I, you can also go to some of the much more wealthier cities in the world and see people that are even further removed from communities mm-hmm. and they're all very detached and they all have their massive mansions and, and nobody really works as a community. And you can see that, um, which is very sad in, in some cities I've been to, it, it very, they feel very soulless and the, mm-hmm. the community isn't there. Um, but then it makes you recognize, well, those are the people in power. They're the people voting or they're the people making decisions. So we, rather than fight against that, we have to recognize why their decisions are motivated by power or money or, you know, people do vote selfishly and that's, and that's absolutely understandable. And so rather than just being angry at the world for going, how stupid, how could you have voted for this? It's actually saying, well, yeah, fair enough. If I'd grown up in that kind of an environment, you know, I would have done the same. So it's about accepting and recognizing that um, people aren't evil for having made a decision that you disagree with. Um, mm. So, so yeah, the sort of two, the, the scale of perspectives I think is really interesting about travel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Gareth and I actually spoke about this recently. Exactly that is like just understand that everyone's had a, st- a journey and a story to get to where they are now and how they made those decisions. And if you have some of that context through travel, through understanding, through taking the time to be curious, then you can actually have some time and space and hold some space for, for everybody around you Absolutely. because they've, yeah. they've all had yeah. that. They all deserve that, you know? So yeah. how do you think that that sort of people can, can add a bit more adventure into their, their own lives? And, and why do you think it's important for people to do in your opinion, or is it even important to do? Yes. yes, it's very important. Um, it's such a good question. Uh, this is something that I talk about a lot. I do a lot of talks in schools to young people who say, well, you know, I'm 15, I can't move to Borneo. And my answer is like, well, yes, you can, but don't, don't tell your parents I said that. Um, uh, or um, I, I host something called the Adventure Uncovered Film Festival, where we, we get, encourage everybody to um, find some some form of adventure in their lives and so the advice that I give is you don't have to go and live in you know Papua New Guinea that's that's for crazy people um, you don't have to do a big adventure and adventure comes in so many different forms for me adventure is literally just doing something outside of your comfort zone it's it's about not being um, settled on the sofa watching Netflix. It's about doing Mm. something slightly bigger than that. So um, I'm a big fan of something called micro adventures, um, which is literally like after work on a Friday, you're gonna drive 30 minutes out of the city with somebody's borrowed kayak or or a a borrowed tent and a sleeping bag and just sleep in a field and come back. That's enough, that's an adventure. For some people that is wild. People who have never wild camped, um, that's kind of crazy. And they get to hear the wood at night and they get to hear the you know owls and they get to or, or, or listen to the ocean or they see the stars for the first time outside of the city i've worked with young people who've never seen a cow or never mm. seen trees never been in a woodland so f- for wow. me you know it's easy to forget for my community there's a lot of us who are adventurers and explorers and global travelers 
it's easy to forget that you don't have to go far to find something that is kind of magical. So I would say, you know, the outdoors is free. You know, go and find a woodland, go and find a river and jump in and swim, go and find a beach and be connected to nature. I think the first thing is find somewhere that is natural. Um, you can have adventures in cities, um, but I think there's something very powerful about being connected to, to the natural world. So, you know, just a walk in the woods, um, or if you can borrow a bike or a kayak or a stand-up paddleboard or a tent or walking poles or anything. Mm. There are amazing communities on Facebook. If you just search like your city and then camping or your city and adventure, and you'll find, you know, whatever it is, adventure club, um, and say, we have communities that I'm a part of where you can, you can message and say like, hey, um, you know, I've never been wild swimming before and I'm kind of nervous and I'd like to try it. And you'll have 50 people replying saying, oh, come with me to this lake this weekend. We're going to just be there for a couple of hours. Um, it's really exhilarating and fun. You just jump in and, and get over your fear and have a splash around. And then we have a hot chocolate afterwards and come back. And somebody That's else good. will say, oh, I'm driving that way. I'll give you a lift. And someone else will be like, I'll lend you a wetsuit or, you know, mm. It, it's great and again it's it's tapping into that local community with the local knowledge um or tapping into other people's um confidence you know if you are scared of doing something because you've never done it before find someone who has mm. and ask them and they'll say oh it's easy yeah no definitely come scuba diving i can teach you or um they'll kind of hold your hand through that process and they'll love it because people who um have these activities people who kayak or people who hike or trail run or camp they are desperate to share it with other people because they have they know the benefit they've seen how nourishing it is they've seen the benefit it has on their mental health they've had that moment of waking up and seeing the stars in the middle of a woodland or they've had that moment of jumping into an ice cold waterfall um and it, it's done one for them and i'm the same i the, the first thing i want to do is just share this with everybody and show them that same experience um so if you if you are feeling unadventurous then you don't have to be an adventurous person that's that doesn't exist i don't think i don't think people are adventurous or not i think everybody um it has the ability to step one step outside of their comfort zone and then you can go two steps and then if you like it you can go 10 steps and then before you know mm. it you'll you'll be in a tree house of borneo in no time yeah, 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 exactly. I love, I love it. It's such great advice, seriously. And like, you know, we, we, there, there is literally adventure to be had everywhere. And that's sort of the, the idea around micro, what, what do you call them? Micro, micro adventures. Micro adventures. Yeah. yeah. Like, um, if, you, such, if you just yeah. Google micro adventuring um, and like micro adventures near me, you'll find people just doing an overnight camp or just even literally like people camp in their garden for the first time. Just, yeah. you know, you don't have to do something big. Just, just get out there. Um, it, and take a journal or a pen and paper or a microphone and reflect as well. I think that's mm. the, the second mm. piece of advice I'd say, like uh, you, you said, you know, why is it important? Mm. Get out there, but then notice what it's doing to you and notice how you feel before and after. Mm. I sometimes will do a voice recording. If I'm, you know, if I'm driving out to um, Wales to go climb a mountain or something for a weekend with friends, I'll take note of how I'm feeling as I'm leaving London on a Friday night and the kind of I'm stressed about this and these are the things that have happened this week and this is where my headspace is and this is physically as well I feel sluggish I feel bloated I feel you know whatever um, and then I do the same thing on the way back and it's just just that contrast of what my brain is thinking about and oh, I've got all these plans for the future and I'm super excited and I've made these amazing connections with these friends and I feel exhilarated and my body feels strong. And, you know, it's like, I didn't suddenly gain muscles in two days and I didn't lose weight in two days. It might, it's the same exact body, but I'm just so much more appreciative of it now. Um, mm. and, and it's the same mind. It just was cluttered with this unnecessary, you know, hashtag first world problems. And, and now it's given me that perspective. So you don't, you don't need to go far to get that. Yeah, for mm. sure. And there's, there's like such amazing kind of energy that we can sort of, you know, take from nature that mm -hmm. it just supplies Absolutely. an abundance to us. Like, you know, we just, if we take that step out into that forest, it kind of just sort of, we, we, we automatically kind of soak it up without even knowing it, you know. Um, there's, a, there's an amazing quote. Um, I was in the, in British Columbia, I uh, spent three months hiking in, in the forests in Northern Canada. And there's this quote, I can't think who it's from. So you have to like insert who it is here, <laughs> edit that in. 
Um, and it says, I walk among the trees and I feel myself grow taller. Mm -hmm. wow. and I, I mean, that's Beautiful. it for me. You know, you, you come yeah. out, you breathe deeper, you stand taller and it's really powerful. Um, I love the connection of uh, nature and, and psychology and mental health. Um, and <laughs> it, it's well documented. It's not even... It's not even new age hippie stuff that like no, exactly. for a walk and <laughs> spending time among the trees or the, on the beach, um, being grounded, being earthed, you know, mm. um, is, is, has a phenomenally powerful therapeutic healing effect. And the fact that half hour walk on the beach can undo a week of stress in yeah. an office, you know, that's, it's, it's the most potent medicine we have um, and it's underutilized. So totally. Yeah. There's, there's, there's like Love these, it. um, negative ions i think they are that uh, are released when a wave crashes and it's just yeah. like these are like positive energetic yeah. things that yeah. just bring calm and and sort of yeah. some peacefulness to your mind which is great um yeah, yeah we actually spoke to our, our latest podcast uh, that we released there uh, was the guy called bo miles and he he also mm -hmm. does these kind of micro adventures but also macro ones and um you know he did the other day what, what he and he posts amazing documentaries we would like to send you one so you can check it out because yeah. you'd really like Please, it um yeah. he did a, he walked to work he's, he says every single day uh -huh. i drive one and a half hours to two hours to work he's like yeah. but what do i miss out on by like driving in my car on the highway you know what i mean and he said and, and and he's a doctor of philosophy and he and he he lectured he did lecture at one of the universities in, in Melbourne and he's like, Cool, I'm gonna walk to work instead. Mm. So he gave himself thirty six hours to walk to work and um he was only able to like um scavenge food as well as like he could and, oh, and, and so cool. drink water from a river um, yeah. or he could ask people, he could ask for money to go to or okay, ask them nice to buy him something. And this was just like that's that's an adventure do you know what i mean and you don't actually have to do anything really yeah absolutely <laughs> um, yeah so it's I those sort of things which are really cool I, I like that he's entirely reliant on nature um and like you know for his water and food um but i also like that he's allowing himself to talk to people because that that is good to to a lot of people travel and they're kind of like you have to be self-reliant and they have these packs with everything they could possibly need and they've got you know cereal bars snack bars they've got you know energy drinks they've got um all like first aid kits full of stuff because they want to be and it's like yeah if you're going into the absolute wilderness if you're going to the arctic you take all of that stuff with you because you are literally self-reliant but if you're going where there's other people ask those other people you know in a way you don't want to isolate yourself from those communities so it's quite nice to turn and knock on someone's door and say hey sorry i'm traveling through um I don't have any food. <laughs> can, you, yeah. can you help me? <laughs> or, you know, I've run out of camping gas or, you know, my, my whatever's broken. And that's how, I mean, all of my favorite moments have come from what would have been my worst moments. You know, they've mm. come from disaster where mm. something's gone wrong or, you know, I've, I've crashed my bike and been badly injured or I've lost everything. I've had everything I own stolen and I'm just like in the middle of some town somewhere with nothing. Um, so you have that moment where for, for a half an hour, it, it's the worst day you've ever had. And then it very quickly becomes the best day you've ever had because the whole community mm. around you comes, oh, are you okay? Do you need a hand? And oh, come and stay with me and let's, let's sort you out. And you can borrow this for now. And, and you're just like, so your faith is so restored. Um, and that's really cool that he did that rather than going somewhere else to do that, that he's done that on his mm. commute to work. Because that just proves that's kind of the same point that I was making you don't need to go far in this adventure on your everyday in your everyday and it's just whether you have the, the eyes or the perspective to spot it and see it I think that's absolutely brilliant I kind of love it there's also something about the commute as well which um, there's a lot of writing about there's a lot of writing about neuropsychology and connectedness to nature and grounding and earthing about achieving flow state do you know mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. Yeah, getting into flow state, which is this idea of being just absolutely creatively and physically aligned and just you have one of those moments where everything comes together and you whether you know you're an author and you suddenly write 20 chapters of your book or um, you know you're a musician and, and it just pours out of you or you're a professional surfer and you have the best competition of your life and it just kind of everything mm. aligned um, and that's kind of achieving this this blue mind or green mind flow state to do with you know you're so connected to the ocean or you're so connected to the land that you're, that you're running through um, and it, it's proven that it increases productivity 
and it increases uh, you know access to our ability to focus and to imagine and to be creative and think outside the box and problem solve and all the things that we need in work um so people who sit in traffic before going to the office are kind of doing their best to undo any chance of achieving flow state that day so <laughs> yeah. Whereas if you if you jog to work or you cycle or you or you or you walk along the river instead of through the city or you walk find some green space, a lot of towns and cities now are creating uh, park cities or um, kind of connected cycle paths and that kind of thing. We are trying to be a little bit more environmental. So um, just getting some fresh air and, and jogging, cycling, running, even if you're still driving, but maybe you go a different way or you have you have a moment to meditate before and after you get in the car or whatever it might be just to try and unlock that that flow state then it boosts mm. productivity and that should be something that employers are encouraging as well Brilliant. yeah i think uh i think like people almost think it needs to be more complex do you know what i mean like mm. you need to be doing crazy things to to be healthy or you know yeah. to improve your kind yeah. of mindset or whatever but actually yeah. it's not it's not it's just do the simple things yeah I read a I read a book called um, Tiny Habits by B J Fogg, who's mm -hmm. a who's a psychologist, behavioural psychologist, about the idea of t tiny habits, um, mm -hmm. how to introduce little tiny changes into your life. Because he said, you know, people first of January, people say I'm going to lose ten pounds and I'm going to run three times a week and you know, I'm going to do a hundred push ups a day or whatever it is. I'm going to I'm going to give up meat. I'm going to give up smoking. I'm going to give up alcohol, and it lasts a day a week and then and then people fail because that's a massive challenge which chemically in your body and psychologically and physically is, is really difficult to to achieve um you know immediately and he actually doesn't believe in willpower he thinks that you know i, I don't know if I, I agree with that but he thinks that willpower is not the right thing to get you through giving up smoking for example so he has this idea of introducing tiny habits every day that just take 30 seconds and it seems really small and insignificant and it's literally things like when you're brushing your teeth you just uh stand on what you know you do calf calf stretches mm. from one leg to the other or every time you pee you do two press-ups <laughs> just like little things and you and you kind of go well that's not going to make me you know schwarzenegger is it but it does because it's achievable it's repeatable it's, it's sustainable and it then mm. it's also not taking up any time out of your day. It's like while you're brushing your hair or while you're waiting for the kettle to boil or when you get in the car, you take five deep breaths before you start the engine. Um, or you say out loud to yourself, like, well done today, Ellie, or like, good mm. job. Or just these like little tiny things. Um, and you do them for a week or two and then they become autopilot because we all have habits where, you know, we all kind of click our fingers every time we stand up or stretch every time we do whatever. Um, we all have these tiny habits so we can just incorporate more and more and what happens is you then get that brain shift where you start doing three press-ups or you start doing five and then if you think oh, I should probably go to the gym today you're more likely to actually go and so it's the same thing with finding your adventurous side just going to work via the river instead of via the, the main road is enough of a tiny habit that to make put you on the path to being more adventurous in, in life mm. yeah yeah, totally agree. Like, it, it, yeah, I mean, it is so important to start with those small steps, like, you know, rather than be overwhelmed with these like massive goals sometimes, especially if you flip and starting from like scratch, you know, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. uh, those, are, those are really cool things to do. Um, and, and I guess like, like you mentioned, like you can search for adventure in all places and, yeah. um, you know, one of the ways that kind of you do it is you actually find it in the form of poetry. Um, mm. So like, how, like where did this passion for poetry emerge for you? Um, I'm not sure really. I've always been a writer. I've always, you know, loved writing short stories and full novels. When I was as a child, I used to read voraciously. Um, we had to get, we had my mum had to get a special permission from the library for me to take more books out than my allowance when I was a kid. <laughs> I was that dorky kid that the librarian loved because I'd go with my stack of books every day and get like <laughs> another six books. Um, so I had a, I had a special library stamp. Um, and so I think being surrounded by uh, language and words and, and literature when I, when I was growing up um, and film, because that is 
very visual and literal and, and, and you know storytelling and narrative has been a theme all the way through my life and um, for me I do like to sort of take the elements of the story and put them in um, a less constructed way so rather than just today I did this this and this and kind of very um, documented I like the idea of poetry because it allows you to be very free with your words and playful and creative um, and to put your own meaning and perspective on them. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I really love about film, um, the more abstract or the more surreal you get with film, the stronger the, um, the, the, stronger the author theory becomes. So if, if you don't know about author theory, it's the idea that the, the writer of the story or the meaning of the, the narrative is not instilled in a film by the filmmaker it's by the viewer the viewer is the author of the documentary or the film um, because if they watch it and they interpret it in a certain way then they're writing their own version of that story um, and so in a way you as a filmmaker you put out something and you think oh this is a film about this and this is the message that i want people to take and then half the audience reads it completely differently um, based on their own personal experience um, an example is the film Jaws, Spielberg's Jaws, best film ever. Um, people have so many different interpretations of what the shark is a metaphor for. They're like, is, is the shark capitalism? Is the shark the patriarchy? Is the shark feminism? Is the shark homophobia? And, and it's the people that think that they see, oh, for me, the shark represents X, Y, Z. It's based on their life experience and they imprint that onto hmm. the film. And, um, you know, for years, people are asking Spielberg what, what was the shark supposed to be? Is it supposed to be science and technology? Is it capitalism? Or, you know, what, what do you think the shark is? And he was like, it's not up to me to say what the shark represents. It's the audience's decision. Um, and I, I love that. And a lot of filmmakers, you know, subscribe to that same rule of, well, I'll put this material out there, but it's up to you. I'm not going to tell you what it means to me. Musicians do the same. A lot of musicians say, well, look, I'm not going to say who the song is about or what this song is about because I don't want to ruin somebody who's listened to that song and it means, you know, it's about their grandmother. Um, I'm not going to turn around and say it's not because for you, mm. it is about your grandmother. And so for me with writing and poetry, that's kind of a similar thing where I find it very cathartic to, to write it freehand and creatively um, my thoughts that just sort of come out of my head. Um, and I might be writing it from one perspective and then, other people read it and they they read into it literally something very different um and i think it allows that author theory to you know once you put a poem out in the world it has it has no it has multiple authors um and i kind of i like that idea yeah, that, yeah that's love so, it. so classic so i got a quite a funny story that happened to me recently yeah. like that's kind of, kind of ties in with author theory um i my wife and i were busy traveling around the world at the moment and we're in brazil now we love movies and we obviously we haven't seen a movie for like a year or something and we were we were in the sort of shopping center the other day and we walked past and and the parasite was on um okay and um basically uh, we, we were then like okay cool let's go see it tomorrow and uh, we just confirmed with them we're like yeah your movies are in english yeah and they're subtitled in portuguese and they're like you know cool cool um so <laughs> we went the next day um and we went to went to go watch uh, parasite and little did I know that uh, Parasite is actually in Korean, Korean, and it's uh, subtitled in English normally. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I had to watch the whole movie uh, in Korean, subtitled in Portuguese, Portuguese, not knowing any of the languages <laughs> <laughs> for two hours. And I was like, okay, this is a challenge. And, I had to yeah. and there's Marissa on. laughing and yes, then crying and you going, yes. yes. The whole, and it, the, the, the theater was packed. And I was like, oh, I wish I was enjoying it like these people, but I yeah. had to make it up myself. So that was quite funny. That's <laughs> and see, that's, that's really interesting to see how you what story you thought this film told what you took away from that film and then if you watch it in english how you'll be like oh i totally missed that about that character or oh i, t oh, I got completely the wrong end of the stick um i used to when i, I used to live in brunei Jerusalem, um and their films are quite heavily censored um, so any kind of touching or sex scenes anything is taken out harry potter is banned there because it's witchcraft um and um James Bond, 
I went to go and see James Bond and the whole film was like 45 minutes long because this, <laughs> they take out all the sex scenes. Shaking, they take out, that's yeah. oh, that's bad. <laughs> they take out all the references, all references to alcohol, all the sex scenes and all violence. So, so oh. there'll be James Bond like talking and then it cuts, like, he'll be talking to a girl in a hotel room and then it just cuts to him running through a city and being like, oh, I've got so to get weird. the bomb. And you're like, why are we now in Budapest? What's going on? Because wow. obviously the whole point of the sex scene is for her to reveal, you know, who she's working for or, yeah, yeah. you know, this is the location. And he has this moment where he's like, oh, it, the bomb is here or whatever. Um, yeah. But because they've taken out the whole scene, you just, you miss these key plot points. So you're watching it and it's just a totally, it's a totally different experience of watching a James Bond film because there's, I mean, it's brilliant, but you're kind of making up the narrative that you've missed. And almost there was one that I watched, one of the Daniel Craig ones, Casino Royale maybe. And I watched mm-hmm. it back in the UK. I then watched the full film. I didn't think it was as good because I was like, oh, well, that's really expository because then it's just like this this, too, this you know and like, too obvious it was too obvious you didn't have there's, there's no like imagination required and they they give away it was kind of like oh well it's obvious that this because they just told you so of course you know same thing with um m night Shyamalan with six sense he thought that was such an obvious scene where bruce willis is you know when he's i see dead people and then it cuts to bruce willis's face as the boy says i see dead people and it cuts his face and he was like, you can't, that's so, ob- everyone's going to laugh. It's a really cheesy, you know, people <laughs> are going to be like, oh my God, this terrible film, you know, it's yeah. so, so obvious. Um, and it was only test audiences that had no idea. And he was like, oh, okay, the way I see it is very different than the way people interpret it. So, hmm. you know, I can get away with, I can get away with it. And it became, you know, it's the biggest twist in film history kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so that's cool. It's kind of cool. It's actually quite an interesting um edit for the people in a way too to still create or understand that there's yeah. a narrative and at least keep the narrative somehow and yeah. and then it's almost like and it kind of links to the next question i wanted to ask you about communication in a way but mm. like you know, how much is fluff and how much is essential yeah. and how much do yeah. we and it's kind of interesting how much we could even in day-to-day conversations and stuff uh uh, distill information down mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. on the other end like just embellish stuff uh uh, to Absolutely. the nth degree it's quite it's quite fascinating that you could still watch a whole movie enjoy it and you know and yeah. even though it was half the length you know so yeah. we're talking about communication off the back of, mm-hmm. of sort of the poetry side of things like you obviously hold communication in high regard it's like an important mm-hmm. thing for you because you're communicating in in different forms uh, with your poetry but also the visual side um and you know why is communication such an important skill for people and like how, mm. how can we like nurture that a little bit more uh that's a tough question it's a good one um for, i mean i i don't know any other way to exist really i i feel like for me connection to other people is just the most important i think we spend a lot of time especially nowadays um you know on a phone screen it, it the most heartbreaking thing for me is when you're on the public transport and there's 50 people just looking at a screen um it's very black black mirror-esque you know we are living in that dystopian future already kind of thing um whereas i love when you are around a campfire or you're at a barbecue and everybody is talking face to face so there's all kinds of scientific studies about human connection and and conversation and communication um, and how nurturing and how nourishing it is and how vital it is for mental health and again unlocks more creative thinking in our brains if you bounce ideas off another person um, but then also from a kind of scientific communication point of view there is information that critically needs to be disseminated among the population so that people can make informed decisions and educated decisions are so so critical yeah. especially nowadays um, there's so much fake news and misinformation and propaganda going around that people need to know how to gather information and how to trust that information or how to work out, as you said, the fluff from the exaggeration and from the reality. Um, and it doesn't mean just being dry facts because science communication that is just dry facts, like scientific journals, nobody reads um, mm-hmm. and it's not engaging. So, I think it's really important that our communication walks that line and it is a fine balance between storytelling and 
connection and empathy and character driven elements that come from the camp that you know the the historical campfire we've been telling stories for 20,000 years um, so there's something very primitive um, about the idea of passing on of information uh, with accuracy and fact and honesty and truth and that's like the hardest thing to say well we've got to tell scientifically accurate information that's non-biased and non-judgmental and totally objective but you need to make people care about it so you have to pull on their heartstrings and you know make them make them realize how it's relevant to them and why they should care um you know there's all these famous quotes about people only people only act if they care about something and how do they care about something they don't know about um so there's there's a wonderful quote by um trevor noah um in his autobiography and he says in the sharing of our stories we find our common ground mm. and that's so true because you can have um you know a, a poacher in in sumatra who has nothing and you know a wealthy woman in chelsea in london who has everything they have grown up in different generations different backgrounds different cultures different language different music different food like they they literally have nothing in common and yet both of them know what it's like to lose a daughter or both of them know what it's like to love a child and if you can tell a story where you explain that commonality and you get people to recognize themselves in another person um, and to sit opposite the breakfast table with that stranger and say well you look different and you sound different and everything you're saying and all the words you're saying i don't know what that food is and i don't know what that place is that town i i we we have nothing in common but you find something where it's like a game that you used to play together or or you both have the same sense of humor and you think mm. ah, that's mad we're from i'm a i'm a five-year-old girl and you're like a 20 year old japanese man and and we're laughing at the same joke mm. as humanity has so many connections so I think communication is important for us to be able to find that because if we just look at each other silently, the judgment is, well, we have nothing in common. And if those two people, um, and the reason I use the example about the, the poacher or the logger in Indonesia is, um, I was asked to make a film about illegal, illegal logging in, um, in Indonesia and in Sumatra. And it was like the eve of the, the, the loggers and how do we stop these, these bad people, these, these people that cut down the forest um, and how terrible they are. Um, and we need to protest and this kind of thing. And I said, oh, there's no way I'm making that film. I, I'll go and meet the loggers, definitely. And I sat down with them and I said, why are you cutting down trees? I mean, I would never do that. I couldn't, I, you could never convince me to cut down a tree because that's just wrong or to kill an animal because that's just morally wrong in my cultural moral upbringing. Mm -hmm. But he said, my daughter has malaria and she is in the hospital and her malaria medications cost 50 US dollars. Hmm. I make $2 a week. She'll be dead by the time I can pay for her medicines. If I cut down this mahogany, I get 75 US dollars. Hmm. And I'm like, where's the chainsaw? Let me help you. You know, let's do no. this. Like, you know, because people can connect to that. People understand the reason behind it and if you can get to know the human story behind anybody's actions or behaviors the same thing as i was saying earlier with understanding why people voted people that voted for trump a lot of them because they were scared and they were promised things and they're frustrated and mm. i almost understand you know i think if we spent time with the people that are different than us we would understand more um but that time can't be spent sitting and staring at each other in angry silence and it also yeah. can't be spent arguing and attacking and being defensive and accusing them it has to be spent on the right form of communication so that we can try and understand each other's positions and once we find that common ground through stories then you have a whole new plane of existence where you're kind of then on a different level of appreciation and understanding mm -hmm. and kindness and compassion at which point you can then say how do we work together to solve this problem um, and that's what i think we need more of and so then um, sorry, I've waffled on far too long, but the yeah. second part of your question was how do you, um, you know, how do we instill that more? And I spent seven years working as a teacher, um, working with young people, and 
I very strongly believe that we, yes, we need to be teaching them, you know, the, the dates of the second the French Revolution and we need to know the chemical equation for glucose. Yes, those facts are fine, but we have Google. I mean, we all have phones. We can, we can find that information out. What's more important to be teaching young people is communication methods. Um, reflection, self-reflection and journaling and um, how to recognize their, their mental health issues and how to recognize how to, how to put language into their feelings. I think a lot of the time people feel anxious or frustrated or they're getting stressed out throughout the day and find it very difficult to vocalize or verbalize that um, and to understand why they're feeling that way. And I communicate with myself all the time. I kind of go, why did I get I felt uncomfortable at that party or, you know, at work yeah. today, I felt frustrated. And why is it, was it just because the work was going badly or I couldn't edit this film or is there something else there? And actually, I suppose I am worried about this. I, you know, I, I, I still, maybe I still have this kind of baggage about something from last week, or maybe it's because mm. I feel this way about that person. And I communicate with myself to again, find the common, common sense understanding. And I think it's really important that we teach those skills to, to young people. Um, and that can start with getting them to write poetry and getting them to write stories. Kids write the most amazing poems because mm -hmm. they're not um, tethered by fear of judgment or mm. um, shame or this isn't good enough. You know, I, I hate that the school system squashes individuality, curiosity and creativity out of people. You know, I think school, a lot of education systems, traditional education systems are probably the worst possible way to educate people um, and actually encouraging play and freedom and creative expression and telling stories um, is, is really, really key. And that gives people the language that gives young people the tools to be able to tell the stories. And then later you can say, well, you know, when do you embellish and when do you, you should probably cut that mm. down or, you know, you can you can steer them, but you've got to let them run first. So, um, yeah, I think we need, I think we need storytelling in schools a lot more. Sure. <coughs> so many, so many powerful lessons in there. And I think like one of the themes that I, that I reckon I'm, I'm hearing as well as like kind of listening and mm. yeah, mm -hmm. if we can just listen more as well, you know what I mean? Like instead of sort of like just shouting back quickly at our, our own thoughts on things yeah. and, and just give people the time and space to kind of say what they have to say so that we can then understand them a little bit better, you know, and understand where they are Absolutely. coming from. That is, that is super powerful. Um, mm. And if we can teach kids that, especially, you know, from a young age, wow, we'll be living in a different kind of place and, you know, in the next kind of yeah. era sort of thing. Totally, totally agree. And uh, communication, we, we've been talking a lot about communication, but it's, it's two sides, you know, 50% of communication should be listening and mm. reflexive listening and open listening as well, as opposed to, I'm just waiting for my turn to talk again. Um, there's a really simple exercise. It blows my mind how powerful it is. I do, um, sometimes I go and I, I get invited to talk in corporate offices um, for unlocking creative thinking and storytelling through in, in work and maybe potentially to market their product and, you know, IT sales, where's the story, where's the common ground, where's the, where's the sick daughter in that, you know, like how do you get people to care about IT software enough to spend millions of pounds on it? Um, and I, so I spent a lot of time working with, um, with groups of people who have known each other for 10 years and don't know anything about each other um, in these offices, uh, which is just so sad, isn't it? You spend more time, if you work in an office, you spend more time with your coworkers than you do with your spouse and you don't know anything about them. Um, but one, this powerful exercise that I do is so, it's like, it was a basic warm up exercise. And then people were so mind blown by it that I've now extended it, which is literally just in pairs, you have a minute to talk about uh, your, yourself, your upbringing. Um, you know, I grew up here, I have two sisters. I, have, I used to have a pet rabbit called whatever. Um, and you can give as much or as little personal information as you want. Or if you're not comfortable sharing, you can just make it up. Um, and tell a story you have 60 seconds and then the other person has 60 seconds and it's an exercise in how you're speaking um, and you know how to tell a story and people just ramble on and you get some people go uh oh what else can I say I think you can't even talk about your life for 60 <laughs> seconds like what they're, they're like I live here and I have a brother 
and that's and it's like well you're 46 and that's all you have to say about your entire life um, <laughs> <laughs> but I then, I then say to them okay now you're each going to tell me the other person's life story to see who's been listening and nobody can do it again it's 60 seconds it's like maybe four or five facts in that time and they're like oh this is keith i think i think is it one sister or two i can't I, and basically it's like they weren't listening so then i say okay now do it again and this time you know that you're going to be asked to stand up and mm. tell that person's story so you have to pay attention because i'm going to ask you to tell me keith's story um and i i say you've got to come up with completely new facts you've got to say something else so now so the first one i do their childhood and the next one i do like their teen life or whatever um and so i'm like okay cool and they do it and then they'll stand up and they go so keith went here and da, 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 blah, 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 and they repeat the entire 60 seconds word for word because we're capable of remembering a minute's worth of facts um especially if those facts have some sort of human context or so oh yeah no i had a pet rabbit too and they that's the bit they remember mm. um and i'm like right okay you should be listening like that all the time you should be listening as if you're having to repeat it back all the time that mm. is actually listening that's the first time you're just sitting there not paying attention. The second time you were absorbing and hearing and understanding what that person said. And the response is, that's exhausting. They're so <laughs> tired. Literally people can't do it. They're so tired after 60 seconds of having to pay attention, they're exhausted. And so then it's like, okay, well then we need to find a way to have these amazing conversations around a dinner table and then go and do meditation or yoga or go for a swim, or, you know, our brain power should be spent on listening. And if that's too exhausting for us, then we need to find ways to relax elsewhere in our day because we shouldn't just be going through life, just glossing over what people are saying to us. Um, mm. And that, that for me was kind of, it was really upsetting when I first was doing these exercises. I was like, wow, re people really don't know how to listen and they've never been taught. But then I saw it as a positive because I was like, well, at least somebody's now teaching them and now they know and now they're going to go home and listen to their wife as well and listen to their kids um and that's really powerful and so then i was like okay i just need to go into every single office in the world and <laughs> get them all to do this and the same thing with schools and so um if teachers can be distilling this information down and and doing these exercises every morning you know it's easy at registration to kind of take turns in telling somebody what they did at the weekend and you have to tell your friend and then your friend has to tell the class it's such a simple exercise and it just trains that brain from an early age to be switched on and actually listening and then i don't think it would be so exhausting i think the reason that mm. adults find it tiring is because they've never done it before it's like if i have to do 50 kilo weights i'm going to have a sore bicep whereas if i've been doing two kilo weights since i was a kid i'm going to be fitter and that muscle is trained and I think if we train our kids' brains to listen from an early age, then we're going to have a whole community of, of communicators in the future. And the world will be a peaceful utopia of wonder and joy. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing there as well is that also to learn to tell your story, knowing that people's con like attention spans are not yeah. amazing and most of them are not listening to you yeah, in depth as true. you might be. So it's also a good idea just to like, be succinct with your language Absolutely. and maybe ask questions in between, keep yep. people engaged. And those are just great skills for teaching something, but also then listening back. So, so, yep. so thanks for sharing. And repeating, that. repeating as well. I remember when I first started teaching and I obviously had no experience and was terrible. I first started teaching and we do one lesson about, you know, we had to learn the difference between the bacterial kingdom and the animal kingdom or whatever it was. And so the first lesson we did all the, all the facts about bacteria. And then the next day they came in and I was like, right, so now we're going to look at how plants are different than animals or whatever it was. Um, now we're going to look at the others. So, so just remind me again about the stuff we learned yesterday and the whole class. Was like, <laughs> <laughs> that was me. <laughs> and I was like, me too. <laughs> guys, I've, I've told you this already. I told you this yesterday or, or five minutes ago because it'd be like okay so this is the fact right here's another fact how does that relate to the first fact and they're all just like <laughs> i realized like oh oh you have to say things 15 times 
okay yeah. i get it and it's not because the kids are stupid they're some bright children i've taught some of the brightest most inspiring most engaging kids in the world i'm so proud it's like one of my proudest things is, is being a teacher um but it's not important to them so why would they remember that mm. and the same thing i always say to them when they're like oh i hate revising i don't like revising my job as a teacher was I said, I'm going to make it so that you don't have to revise. And they're like, yes, no homework. What? Huh. Um, and I said, no, no, no. Like, okay, you have to sit down and write flashcards, right? With the little highlighters and the bullet points. Like these, this was the battle of the Somme. And then this is the chemical equation for whatever. And this is the name of an oxbow river or this type of volcano. And they write these facts out and they highlight all these words. And I say to them, when's Harry Styles' birthday? And they're like, 5th of November, miss. I'm like, <laughs> okay. Did you write that down on a flashcard? Do you study like all of the members of One Direction and like that's his favorite color and that's it? And they're like, no, because we love, we love One Direction or we love Justin Bieber. They know everything about him because they love the subject. And if you love something, you remember the facts on autopilot. You didn't have to mm. study how to tie your shoelaces because you did it a thousand times. You don't have a little diagram that you get out every time you post it. Like, oh, oh, yeah, left over right. Mm. Because you started that young and you did it a thousand times. So it's a combination of repetition, starting young, so that stuff becomes autopilot, but then also making them care about it. If you care about something, you never have to learn anything because you just know it. You know? And that's the willpower thing you were talking about earlier yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You have these tiny habits of doing things every day. And for me, that was my job. I was like, I'm not here to teach you facts about science i'm here to make you love science so you need never need to remember That's any so facts cool. because you're gonna you're gonna know them and then you they come out of the, the class parents would always say to me at parents even they're like you've ruined dinners because now our kid comes home and is going did you know that the biggest tree in the world and blah 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 and <laughs> the whole dinner is just them telling all these facts and they didn't study those facts to learn them they just remembered them because they cared about them so yeah the the whole idea of um repetition and early early installation of that of that repetitive nature and then getting them to care and understanding that people will only remember the bits of the story that they connect with so you've got yeah. to make whatever your main message if you're telling a story or giving a talk what's the main single fact and how do you put that into several different examples or metaphors i use metaphor and analogy all the time mm. because like nobody cares about plastic pollution but they do care about their own connection to it so let's try and lead them down that path um and that's yeah that's i found that to be really powerful the idea of telling the stories from their perspective and their window on the world mm. because then they don't need to learn anything they don't need to remember anything because it's they they already you know they already know it so, yeah I love that. It's like, yeah, if you can, if you can bring out some emotion, you know, that that yeah. person can connect with, then flip and now you've done, you've done, you've told a great story, you know, and you've, mm. and you've got them interested, which is, which mm. is very powerful. Um, and you certainly tell amazing stories. I must say, I'm just like <laughs> totally enjoying this chat so much. Like, um, <laughs> and so, so thank you for that. So Ellie, you talk about, talked about uh, being a school teacher. And I think in 2012, you actually uh, left uh, teaching to go travel to Borneo um, yes. and to kind of follow in the footsteps of a childhood hero of yours, uh, David Attenborough. And, um, Greatest storyteller in the world. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, you know, never mind his storytelling, but also kind of the tone of his voice and these sort of things. I oh. think very powerful as well in storytelling. Um, Not unlike yours, Gareth. <laughs> I wish, but <laughs> people are like, whoa. <laughs> um, classic. Uh, so, so, Ellie, what are, the, um, what are the pros and cons of traveling solo, in your opinion? Ooh. Um, I don't think there are any cons. Um, but I'm going to be controversial and say there aren't, there aren't any. Um, pros are endless. Um, Sorry, before before you, before you sorry before you go into the the, the pros, um, a, 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 about seven years ago I was traveling around uh, South America for for like mm. six months, and and I, I ended up traveling with um, with the Dutch girl for two of those months, and uh, so she was scared to travel by herself. So mm -hmm. is that not a con at all? Like you know that some say yeah, females I'm, might feel, or yeah. even males too. I'm being very blasé, of course, and um, about it. Uh, the, yes, the, it is. It is tough um, traveling by yourself. It is 
extraordinarily tough as a woman to travel by yourself in certain situations um and if you're not somebody that is used to it or you know prepared for it or um kind of gutsy enough to to stand up for you know following your gut instincts i i wouldn't recommend it to everybody i certainly would, would wouldn't recommend it to all um all women to go off and just do it immediately i think that idea of micro adventuring is really good i know a lot of women that come and talk to me and say i could never do what you do and it's like yes you definitely could but not all at once maybe just start because i didn't i wasn't like four years old like i'm off to borneo you know um mm -hmm. so uh i think that it shouldn't be scary the same thing as i said if some if you've never camped before if you've never gone kayaking before go speak to somebody that has done it and get them to hold your hand and give you the confidence to be out of your comfort zone um I have had some terrible experiences as a solo female traveler. I have had to leave hostels in the middle of the night because men are breaking into my room and trying to attack me. I've had to run down alleyways and down the street. I've had to leave my stuff behind. Um, I've had to escape some pretty horrific situations. And there are times that I have kind of gone, yeah, I probably, that was a bit, that was pretty dangerous. Or I, I'm quite, kind of amazed that I survived that. Um, for me, I think it's gut instinct and um, not having the fear of being just following your gut because that is the same. I've had that where I've checked in somewhere and it's just been a little bit just unsettling or a little bit dodgy or somebody's looked at you in a certain way as you're walking, walking home at night and you just think no and you turn around and you go to a bar, you go stand up to uh, one thing I always do. First, you wear a wedding ring. Um, regardless of whether you're married um, and you go into a bar and you walk up to a group of people and you go hey guys sorry I just there's a guy standing outside and he's a bit creepy so can you just pretend that you know me thanks so much and they, everybody will always just be like yeah sure no worries and I've had um, people you know pretend to be a boyfriend or, or walk me home walk me back to my, where I'm staying um, one time I didn't want to walk along the beach because it was a, a bit dangerous um, there was somebody who was loitering and lingering and I was like, yeah, that guy's going to follow me. So I um, put my stuff in a dry bag and I swam around the island. <laughs> no ways. Swam around the beach instead. And he was like, <laughs> oh, she got away. Oh, um, no ways. <laughs> so you've got to kind of be, think on your feet. Um, obviously, the sensible things that you can do are you always, nowadays, we've got phones and data and Wi-Fi and stuff, which is amazing. We're so much more connected. So you can let people know where you're going always. Leave notes in your guest house, your house or your hotel. Um, tell people where you're going, what time you're back and where, what you're wearing and what you're expecting to, you know, be doing. Like I'm going kayaking um, in, you know, on this bay for two hours and I expect to be back at this time um, with phone numbers and contact numbers for the right people. You always know where the nearest police station is. I always have uh, the emergency number as um, on my phone. I have a thing where you can press the button three times on one side and it will automatically call a certain number that you pre-program. So mm -hmm. I program that to the local emergency line. Um, and um, there's a really great, great quote from, uh, I can't think of her name. She was a phenomenal. She was like one of the world's first female solo travelers and all through the 1890s to the 1920s. She just went all over the world by herself. Mm -hmm. And somebody asked her, how do you do that and she said learn to look as if you know where you're going even when you're completely lost mm. um walk as if you know what you're doing even when you're just wandering you know look, walk with purpose and learn to shout your brother's name at a moment's notice even when he's on the other side of the world mm -hmm. and mm. i've done that before i've been in a you know a bazaar in morocco and i'm being hassled by people and i just go tom 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 like that and they, oh. they all disappear everybody disappears or you say oh my oh. husband is joining me um, when you check in, oh yes, my husband is on another flight. He's coming tomorrow. Um, you know, it annoys me that you have to do this because I, I hate yeah. the feminist in me hates that I have to pretend I have a big strong man with me to be safe. But if that's that's the you know we take an umbrella so we don't get wet. We, we have tools yeah. to keep us safe, and that's one of them. Um, so there are there are ways around it, and not being scared to walk away. Um, I think disconnect from your possessions is really key because I know some girls that have been like oh well I have to pack that they're, they're scared of the somebody in the next room or they're somebody's knocked on the door it's been a bit dodgy and they start packing their stuff it's like no dude just get out the window and go like 
your mm. life is more important than than your bikinis you know nobody cares get out of the window and and go to another place and again like i said earlier you can then go to those communities and say help me you know um i need i need clothes <laughs> i need food um so the the kind of drop and run approach is is quite useful so yeah i've now made it sound really negative haven't i no, no, well, now um, you can definitely go into the into the pros <laughs> um, yeah it's those things aside and they are minor percentage you know i say i've got into some really bad situations i've been traveling for the best part of 27 years you know i I've spent a lot of time by myself in, in countries that are dangerous. Um, and I've had a handful of occasions where I've not felt safe or where I've had to, you know, escape from certain situations. And partly it's just being sensible. I, I wouldn't go out. I don't drink alcohol, so I'm not going to be staggering home, you know, getting lost or going down the wrong alleyway or anything like that. Um, not that women shouldn't be allowed to drink. They absolutely should be allowed to and should enjoy that. And that's, that's their prerogative. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's a minor, minor, minor percentage of the time that you spend. And the, the positive moments are so worth it. Um, the pros of traveling alone are that connectedness and that communication with local people and the way that you, firstly, you have a lot of time to reflect and to write and to journal and to think when if you're with a group of people, you just fill that time with idle chatter or polite small talk. Mm. Um, rather than just being able to sit on the beach and watch the sun go down and just be present in the moment. So it allows you that quite self-indulgent silence, which if you're with people, people don't like silence because it's awkward for them. Um, and it also means you're speaking, forces you to learn languages. I speak loads of languages from traveling alone. If you travel with your friends, what's going to happen? You're all going to sit in a bar together talking English to each other, you know? Mm. Um, so if you turn up and you're like, oh, I have, I have to communicate differently. I have to, the only way I can get on this bus, I can't ask my friends or we can't use Google Translate. We, I have to try and talk to this little woman at the market and try and find out the bus time from her. So I'm going to have to, you know, buy some grapefruit and I'm going to have to use a lot of hand gestures and figure this out. So I quite like it because it gives you the opportunity to, to problem solve. And then you meet amazing people that i wouldn't i wouldn't necessarily meet if i was traveling in a group or um, with another person um so i think time to reflect and time to think combined with that forced immersion into a completely new world um that allows you to really appreciate and get to know um other people and it might be other travelers that you meet as well but that's really interesting um because then that you have this collision if you stay in a hostel you know you have this collision of of interactions of all different lives and people are backpacking at different ages from different reasons and they're all they're all trying to find something different um and you might have a few weeks where you spend some time with them and then you go off on your own again um and i think it's quite nice because you can kind of take certain elements from them and advice and oh you should stay at this place or go up this mountain or whatever um but then you you kind of need to go back off on your own again. Well, I do anyway. I kind of go into a town. I'm like a, what are those like wild animals that is off in the forest and then I come in and I <laughs> go through someone's bins, <laughs> get, some, get some food and I'm like, yep, okay, now I can go back off on my own again. Um, so it's kind of like every now and then I come out of the wild and, and recharge with people. Um, but that's because I'm, I'm quite an introvert. So I, I do find it tiring. It's, it is exhausting, you know, being in a social situation where you're actively listening to a lot of people. Um, mm. And I'm somebody that I have a high level of empathy and I take on everybody's baggage and burdens and I absorb a lot of people's energy. So if I'm spending a lot of time in backpacker hostels or in, you know, big groups where you're traveling for work, where you're traveling in a, in a team, I do need my own space a lot. Um, so when I'm on expedition where it's all shared, shared cabins and um, a lot of teamwork all day, it, it is important to carve out that time to yourself to just go and sit and quiet and reflect. And traveling on your own allows you to do that very indulgently mm. all the time. So, mm. yeah. That's awesome. And actually, Bo, the one guy we spoke about earlier, we will put you in, you know, to send mm. some of his stuff through to you. He actually, Please, yeah. his research 
part of his research that he did was um, on expeditions and the sort of dynamics mm. of alone versus people. And it would be quite interesting to see what his research was about. There. Actually, we'll definitely mm. try and get that from him. But um, yeah. you did so much on that trip and you, you, know, you taught biology, you led an expedition, um, you connected with nature. But it wasn't all like amazing because you actually were struck by a truck, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And, and then, so, so how did you yeah. sort of deal with that? But, but also, how do you deal with setbacks that these things that you mentioned a moment ago? How do you actually mm. deal with these things in life in general? And what gets you up and going again and, and sort of just to mm. sort of get on with it? That's a good question. That particular incident was um, a bit like I said earlier, the, the best parts of my journey have come from the worst moments. Um, because the three months after that crash were easily one of my top ever travel experiences. Um, that was in um, an island in the middle of uh, Lake Toba, which is in the middle of northern Sumatra. Um, and yeah, I was hit by a truck and woke up a few days later in somebody's house. And the local community had picked me, like scraped me up off the road and carried me about three miles. Um, to the nearest village um, and patched me up and fed and watered me and bandaged me um, and brought all of my belongings as well. Mm. I woke up and I was like, oh, well, I've lost all of my, you know, obviously my, mm. my wallet, my keys, my phone, my camera was smashed all over the road. Um, and then it was all there sitting next to me on the, on the bed in this little, in this little hut, mm. all of these little broken bits of my camera that they, they picked up off the road and brought back to me. Wow. And then um, over the next few weeks, all the school children came in, all these little children would come in and visit me and they would all bring me oh. these coins mm. and they were the coins that had been in my pocket that had just gone all over. The road. And these are the, some of the poorest people in the world. Wow. And nice. I was not expecting, and I got every penny back. What? And I was like, no, you keep this. This is like, you know, it's 50 cents or whatever. And these little children had found these coins in the road and rather than go, yay, sweet. I could, you know, as, as wow. a lot of kids would, they were like, this belongs to that lady. And they, they brought it back to me and they made, they made me little decorations out of banana leaves. And I had planned, I was supposed to be there for three months doing um, like kayaking and hiking and bird watching and filming up on the volcanoes. And um, it was very active. I had everything booked as well. And um, they, they, um, it completely changed for me because then I, I broke my back. So I was immobile mm. um, and I was pretty bashed up and bandaged and so on. And every morning, this lovely um, lady would come. She's really, really old, you know, and they're all wrinkly and old. She was just like, oh, I just want to just give her a little squeeze. <laughs> she was so cute. She was only about four feet tall and she'd come in with all these leaves and she'd put all the leaves in her mouth and she'd chew them up and make a paste and then spit this paste out and rub it on all like I had all of this was all destroyed wow. she'd rub it on all of my wounds wow. and I have I have zero scars I mean <laughs> goodness knows what these these people know there's, there's a trillion dollars worth of medicine wow. in those jungles that we just haven't found yet you know um oh it would be a certain berry that she'd if I was if I was vomiting because so I think I had quite bad concussion. I had quite bad head injury. So I was very dizzy and, and nauseous for several, several days. Um, and if I sat up and it made me vomit, she'd just go and get some nut or some berry or whatever and come back in and rub it under my nose. And I'd be like, oh, I'm completely fine now. I'm instantly better. Wow. I mean, this stuff was magic. Um, so cool. And uh, so she looked after me and just cared and washed my wounds. And I mean, just incredible. Um, level of like care and service and they just all took such good care of me and then the children would come in and play me little songs and they bring their little musical instruments and they taught me how to play it's kind of like a ukulele their version um, so we spent weeks just playing music and um, somebody would come and do like massages and then they did they brought all their spices and they just like cooking in my room so that I could see no them worries. cooking because I was interested and I was pointing and asking and, you know, wanting to taste. So I learned Indonesian cooking from a bed watching these women nice. and they would, you know, I'd, I'd get to grind something up probably really badly. And then they'd be like, yep, okay, I'll just take over and finish it. Um, <laughs> so I think it was one of the most special periods. Um, one of the most profound kind of moments of, 
love and care and the best of humanity that I've ever seen. And they wouldn't take wow. a penny from me. I've been back twice and I've taken them, you know, I've taken um, school books and pens and things for the children, but I wanted to pay for my stay. I wanted to pay for food. I wanted, you know, they wouldn't, it's almost wow. insulting. They, they, they didn't, they were like your family. You don't owe us anything. And it's just, I do think about them a lot when, you know, you've gone on the underground in London and you hate all of everybody in the world. Yeah. And you're like, you I come out of the tube and I'm like, all people are the worst. And then I have to kind of, okay, actually, you know, there are good people in the world. So um, that was, that was a very profound experience. And that's, that's how you ask, you know, how do I cope with it? Or how do I get over it? That's how mm. it's uh, these, these tough moments of your life are followed by real moments of faith in humanity where you see, mm. oh, you know, there are, there are good, there is good um, everywhere in the world. And the other thing I'd say as well is that you just kind of brush yourself up and uh, brush yourself off and, and stand up and get on with it. I, there's a really cool quote about, I don't want to be put in my grave in pristine condition. I don't want to like slowly slide into my grave. I want to come crashing broken <laughs> guard into my grave, you know, like at the end of, you know, at the end of your life, you shouldn't have a pristine body you know you should be kind of destroyed and damaged and like yeah that's that's you know that's a that's a person you've done stuff you've lived done yeah. stuff, you've lived yeah exactly like that's why i say about wrinkles because i love it i'm like so so you're telling me that in my life i will laugh so much that it permanently scars my face that's cool <laughs> like to have had that much oh, laughter that you have literally scarred your body that's amazing yeah you know like that's something to be proud of it's the same thing with um mothers who have stretch marks and they're like no they're my tiger stripes that show i grew a child you know like <sighs> that's amazing what um, do i do about this frown line though that's not good <laughs> that's cool because that means you've been that means you've been curious that means you've gone what that's crazy that's cool that means you've had like moments of so much curiosity that your face has like deformed that's amazing. Yeah. That's really cool. Uh -huh. Your face is deformed, Craig. Yeah, no, we heard it first on this yes, podcast. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm also <laughs> sticking with the, the smiling thing so much. So that's my excuse for all my wrinkles. Nice one, face. buddy. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot for that, Eddie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, classic. But you know, you mentioned something then about like, um, you know, these people have so much knowledge of mm, like, nature yeah. and plants and stuff. And I remember I was... Uh, I was doing the Inca trail and one of the, the guides that was with us, he was like, um, he took a stinging nettle, right? And mm. he's like, he's like, yeah, I used to have varicose veins. And, um, what? what happened was when he, when he first got them is he went to the doctor and the doctor said, yeah, we're going to have to do an operation to remove varicose veins. And then what he did is then he went and he told the kind of Sherpas that were, you know, that did these sort of walks all the time. And they said, what are you talking about? They're like, all you need to do is you need to take a stinging nettle and for like about three weeks, every single day, make sure you just hit it like, you know, for a few minutes a day, which obviously wow. like will burn as much as thing. Yeah. But he said, he said they disappeared because he, they, that's what he did. Yeah. Like, I'm what? not, I'm not surprised. It's mad, Crazy. but I'm not surprised. Like living in Borneo and Papua New Guinea. And the, I mean, the, the pharmaceuticals in that jungle are bonkers there's mm. a lot of stuff that is psycho i mean psychoactive there's all kinds of stuff that mm. people take they go in the jungle and they come out and they're like i have no idea what just happened but someone gave me a berry <laughs> and then now it's a month later um but there's uh, i went i had a similar thing we did a we did a walk in i can't think that was in kuching in um in southern malaysian borneo um and i did a walk in the forest there and it was like a herbal it was like a herb and spices hike um with this local guide mm. who was really knowledgeable um and he's walking through the forest and he's like, this one is for migraines. This one is for pregnancy. This one is for cancer. This one is for whatever. And I, was, and I said, well, what, when you say this one is for cancer, you know, what, what type? And he's like, well, this leaf is for breast cancer and this leaf is for prostate cancer. And I'm wow. like, well, ha, what does that mean? And he said, well, you make a tea and you drink it every day for three months and then you have no cancer. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's easy in the West to say, well, that's not true. Um, but there's, no cancer in those in those populations mm. you know so and, and another interesting thing is that we we all go and try and isolate those active ingredients yeah. but sometimes it doesn't it doesn't work yeah. the same because yeah. it doesn't have the 
it's not in the same region maybe or exactly. or exactly. like it's not combined with something else and yeah, yeah. and we well, just I, and we poo poo that we think oh that's yeah. just you know some what's weird the, medicine what, in the bush you the know science behind it yeah we try and and then yeah. we try and recreate a, a laboratory version of that because it has to be sterile yeah. and whatever and we try exactly. and recreate it and it's like but you don't know what you know you're taking one you take one word out of a book the story exactly. isn't there so it's the same thing i am i am a massive advocate of aloe vera i use mm. it for everything again because i grew up with my mum using it have you seen the film um big fat greek wedding yeah yeah yeah, yeah and the guy with the windex the, the dad is always like just sprays windex on everything yeah like, <laughs> you like that my, <laughs> my mum was like that with aloe vera like whatever we did we come in oh i scraped my knee or oh, i have a stomach ache i got you know uh, indigestion or oh i got some sunburn or i have a cough it would be like put some aloe vera on it, drink some aloe vera. Um, and it's unbelievable. My, my dad, when my, when my parents were on their honeymoon, my parents went on their honeymoon and just like, didn't come back for years. Um, they, my, my dad came off his motorbike um, and he was, it was, this was in the Turks and Caicos. Um, so he was just in a pair of shorts. He came off his bike and took all the skin off his back on a gravel mm. road. Right. Um, all the skin off his back like badly it was high speed and it was gravel and it was it was grim and then it's a hot country and so you're like that's gonna be infected that's gonna be bad so he just lay on his front and mum just went and chopped chopped down like an entire aloe vera and blended it up and just rubbed this pit like every hour for a week wow. and he was complete like totally healed no scarring no infection no pain wow. nothing um, and that was when she was like this is a miracle. This is the this is. Um, And so we use it all the time now. And my my mum gave me actually from that same same aloe vera plant. She brought some back. And then in our wow, conservatory awesome. when we were little, we had like hundreds of these aloe vera plants. Um, and then when I moved up here, she she kind of pots them. You know, she takes a little piece of the plant and then it regrows. So then she's given some to me. And now I have hundreds. I mean, they oh, spread. So and cool. I give them to people. It's all from that same original plant. So wow. I have my friends that have, aloe, you know, it's my mum's aloe vera from the 70s. Um, and they use it. And it's like any skin conditions put some aloe vera. Any digestion puts some aloe vera. And um, aloe vera has two and a half thousand active ingredients in it. And only like three of them are known. It, mm, there's wow. loads of stuff in aloe vera that we don't even know what it does. Or like we, we, they've named it, but they don't understand the mechanism. They don't understand the, wow. the interactions between them. So... That's why, again, I don't, I don't have, you know, when you get like aloe vera gel or aloe vera, something that's with aloe vera added, because it's quite often a bit of a synthetic, mm. those three ingredients, those three that they know. It's like, just go and get the plant. You know, yeah. it grows everywhere. It's a succulent. It, it grows. You don't, I go away on expedition for six months. I come back and it's completely fine. I, I water it like once every 10 years. Um, <laughs> so everybody should just, that's, that's my other advice. Everyone have an aloe vera plant in your house. Oh, maybe we can use that for a bit of a coronavirus. Like, so. Yeah, who knows? We need to go back to Indonesia and just go, which, which of these leaves is for corona? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> and he'll be like, that one there, done. Yeah, he's like, yeah, what Gareth, here's a, here's a quiz yeah. for you, bud. What, what yeah. is the one in South Africa that everyone uses? Uh, what is the... It's in a little tin. Uh, what, what are you talking it's about? A cure -all. It's a cure-all, uh, like for uh, skin and everything. Uh, yeah, there's a couple. Don't know, but Zambak, but Zambak. Uh, I've never heard of it. Never heard of it. <laughs> no ways. No ways. Never heard of it. Oh, we're gonna have to talk after this. Yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> and what is that like? What is that from? Is it a, a cream? Or I a have leaf no or idea what it is. It's like a. It's like a, a local herb that they put into like a gel form. Mm. They mix it in with it like a gel, and it's like mm -hmm. you buy it in these little tins. But literally, people use it for everything, everything. like any like a disinfectant or a tract on a wound, or a, if you've yeah. got a splinter, you put this over it. Like yeah. literally, yeah. like everything. Yeah, it's yeah. probably got aloe vera in it. Actually, I'm, I must actually probably. look what. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, classic. Uh, so, so just kind of before we move on, I guess we couldn't like kind of you know go on without asking you uh what was it like to interview david attenborough oh man i he just he i mean obviously in the uk he's everyone's granddad right he's like <laughs> we all claim him right he's 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 a god <laughs> um, and and it's kind of i was very um just as a, a little tangent sorry a little backstory i was very um uncertain about 
being proud of being British for many, many years. I would not identify as being British because I was ashamed of British people and British tourists. And mm. you'd see these people abroad and I'd be saying, I'd be staying in a local place and being like, no, 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 that, that's not where I'm from. Like, I, that, I apologize for their behavior. Because <laughs> um, unfortunately, a lot of, it's like same thing with American tourists or British tourists or Australian tourists. Sometimes the worst people out of that country are the ones that you kind of meet in a, a bar somewhere. Yeah. They're not the best ambassadors, potentially. Um, and I, I would, people say, where are you from? And I'd be like, oh, you know, I've, I'd, I'd say I grew up with Caribbean influence or um, I've lived in Asia for the last five years or, oh, I've, I've, I've been living here. And I would be really ashamed of my British heritage. David Attenborough is one of the few things that makes me proud to be British um, because I'm like, that little bit, bit closer to him. He was my, um, he was, he was, like granddad to me growing up you know he was on the tv and i watched I, I didn't watch any tv at all as a child apart from david attenborough he i mean everybody did in the uk every sunday night you just sit and you just the voice would just flow over you and the stories and the and again the connection to the characters of the, of the animals and um so he's been a big influence in my life in terms of getting me my, my love of nature i watched a program about the elephants when i was about three I've got an amazing photo of me in the newspaper that I found recently huh. where I was like, I'm going to, I need to say, mummy, we have to save the elephant. Um, <laughs> and so we had to organize a, a walk in the woods with like, I dressed as an elephant and I had a sign saying, save so the elephant. Cool. No ways. And, 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 and I saw it in the newspaper. I saw this little newspaper clipping of me, like little three year old me with my little sign. <laughs> and I was like, what mum, what, what is this? And she was like, well, you really wanted to save the elephants that day. So, and I was like, what? <laughs> How, I, in, in my memory of it, I saved the elephants, and she was like, "No, you you raised eleven pounds fifty, and we sent it to nice. the WWF." And I was like, <laughs> oh, "Okay." Um, so he he was obviously very powerful influence um, in to me as, as a child growing up. Then, as I became a filmmaker, obviously, then it's even more significant to me um, his kind of advice or his guidance or um, the opportunity to travel um following his footsteps but also my first film i was able to include footage at the beginning first line and the last line of my first film uh, uh, david Attenborough, which is partly my homage to him but also because mm. he started talking about something that was exactly relevant to the film that i was making which was in set in borneo and um uh the question was, you know, what's your favorite place in the world? You've been everywhere. You're David Attenborough. You've, you've been everywhere. What's your favorite place in the world? And of course you expect him to say a very diplomatic answer of, oh, well, you know, there's beauty and everything. And there's, mm. I've been lucky and ev everywhere has its own story and everywhere has its own unique, special, you know, importance. And obviously everybody, it was the whole crowd listening and everybody's like pin drop silence because he paused my favorite place. And he went, I, I guess I would say Borneo. And I was like, ah, Whoa. making a form about Borneo. <laughs> and then he just went off on this, he went off on this beautiful, you know, the way he does with his words. Yeah. He started explaining about the importance of Borneo um, and how he says, and he says, my, my grandchildren say to me, grandfather, you knew, you knew what was happening to the world and you did nothing. I couldn't live with myself. Hmm. And everybody's everybody's crying. Um, it's just it was just so powerful, and so so being able to include that in in my first film was just I mean it's such an honor and a privilege for me. But I was filming it, and um, I had tears in my eyes because <laughs> it's my hero, and so it's the only shot of the film that's out of focus. <laughs> oh, no way! Because <laughs> yeah. I was just like. This is so amazing. And I'm looking at the screen being like, this is my hero. And he's sitting right there. And he's oh, like, no. I could literally, there's an, oh, it was just too much. It was too much for me. <laughs> and I don't, I don't sort of, I don't get like fangirl or whatever. And I, I work with a lot of people who are, you know, celebrities or well-known and they're just normal people. And I'm like, Hey, cool. Nice to meet you. Let's get this interview done or whatever. But D David Attenborough is somebody that I, um, yeah, he kind of floors me. And I got, you know, right here. I got this letter from mm, no him. ways um and this i was standing at the doorway and um my neighbor gave it to me because uh, he 
he'd left it outside. And he was like, oh yeah, you got some posts. And I was going through my bills. I was chatting to my neighbor and I was in the doorway opening my post like, oh yeah, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I saw this, I was like, oh, is this from my uncle? Who's, I didn't recognize the writing. And I opened it and it's a letter from David Attenborough. And I, no I, I fell on the floor in my doorstep and I cried for like three hours. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's so meaningful to me that um, he gave me that opportunity and, um, and gave me, you know, sort of believed he's he's such a strong supporter of of young people and young filmmakers and of people continuing to carry on that baton kind of you know hmm. like there's a, there's a beautiful video on youtube it's a really sweet little clip of a little boy crying in the window and there's all the rain coming down the window and he's looking out of the window and he's like <gasps> and the mum is kind of giggling and she's filming it and she's like um oh what, what, hey hey buddy what's what's wrong and he turns to the mum and he goes what what will people do when David Attenborough dies? Oh. And she's like, she's like crying and kind of laughing. And oh. she's like, oh, that's, she's like, that's oh, so that's sad. Sweet. It's so sad. <laughs> but then it's like, but genuinely, you know, but genuinely what will, like, it, I'm, I'm not, I'm going to be a mess. Um, yeah. So having had the privilege of meeting him and, and, and working with him is, is absolutely priceless. Yeah, he's wow. such a legend very moving yeah. and it's so true you know every time you bring something new when you still see oh there's another he's, he's doing the voice of another show you kind of like mm -hmm. yes the, 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 there's still something left you know like because yeah. yeah. like, exactly for that same reason of what you're saying you're like when when will be the last one and just it's yeah. really sad you know? oh there's a there's a, um, a ha there's a thing on twitter called very british problems um mm. which is brilliant and it's just joke it's just uh, memes of awkward british things and humor um but there's one which is really powerful which is like when you go abroad and you're watching a nature documentary and it's not david attenborough's voice and you can't watch it you just, you're like what is this are you watching some lions you know you, you turn on your your tv in a, in a hotel and it's like some lions and then it's like some random voice comes on and you're like ah you have to turn it off because it's not real it's not real tv <laughs> oh, classic yeah. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. um so Eli, look i, mean, I know we we sort of coming to our time here but i we couldn't not mm. touch on this uh, a little bit mm. and uh plastic and environmentalism is obviously yes. massive in in your life and uh, uh and it features a lot in your work and in just your life mm -hmm. in general um tell us a little bit about your startup um ellipsis uh, if you yeah. don't mind so ellipsis uh is um a company that i launched this year, um, but it's had about three years of R and D. I ran it as a charity for a couple of years in the UK, um, and sort of as a proof of concept. Essentially, we're Google Maps for plastic. Um, it's a, a piece of software. It's an algorithm, which is a machine learning, which can use image detection to automatically spot, detect, and categorize plastic in aerial images. So what we do is I say we're treasure hunting plastic. So we can survey um, beaches, coastlines, rivers, um, any kind of land or ocean surface. Um, and we can fly a drone over or we can use satellite images or walk along with your phone and take images. But we gather that imagery, run it through the algorithm and it processes it, scans it and it automatically detects plastic. So it creates a heat map of plastic pollution. Now the cool thing is that that heat map is by plastic type. So hmm. plastic bottles, caps, fishing nets, uh, toothbrushes, hygiene waste, but it's also temporally. So if you have a scan every month or every year, you can look at the change over time. So you can look at how that plastic is moving, how long it's staying on the beach um, or how far down the river it's traveling. Um, and if you've, if you've done a beach clean, for example, you can look at the free accumulation rate and that allows us to target the hotspots more effectively mm -hmm. so it's all about um optimizing or maximizing efficiency and therefore reducing operational costs for the government for beach cleaners for um charities for corporates for for um, waste management facilities so for example um there's a there's a council in east sussex in the uk and every week they send uh, a van and a team of staff to drive around all the beaches that are about two hours away from the recycling facility. And they drive around, they drive to the beach, they collect the plastic and bring it back. Some weeks they get there and there's no plastic on the beach. So complete waste of time and money for everybody. Um, sometimes they get there, there's, there's been a storm surge or there's been a 
you know, a party the week before, whatever, there's too much plastic, they can only collect half of it and the rest washes into the sea. And once it's in the sea, it causes untold damage. So mm. what we're able to do is these councils or waste management facilities, recycling centers, they can subscribe to our platform and they can see heat maps like Google Maps um, that will show them where the biggest accumulations of plastic are and when. Um, and by different plastic types, and then they can send their task force to the right place at the right time with the right mm. amount of people or the right size truck. Um, so it just massively increases the efficiency of that collection. And the other thing that it does is it allows you to categorize by type. So there are companies now with this amazing technology that we have where they're, they're manufacturing road surfaces out of recycled ocean plastic, mm. or they're making biofuels out of it, or they're melting it down and making it into clothing. There are so many different companies making, whether it's surfboards or building materials, housing, like sort of mm. freeze blocks from ocean plastic, but it needs to be the right type. Um, and so some, they might want to collect all the fishing net or they might want to collect all the clear plastic bottles. And so you could have two beaches a hundred miles apart. They both have a ton of plastic on them, but beach A has a ton of fishing net and beach B has a ton of food waste or toothbrushes. Um, and so knowing where to go to collect different types of plastic means that we can just divide up our resources more effectively. Um, and mm. what it does is the aim is to capture all of that missing plastic and return it back into the circular economy to make it valuable again. Um, mm. So the two things that I think are important that people understand about plastic, number one, 99% of it is missing. So of all the plastic that enters the ocean that we know comes from industrial waste, from fishing industry, from sewage outlets and from trash blown from the beach, 99% um, of everything that enters the ocean, we don't know where it goes. It's not, it's not mapped. We have no idea. We don't know which beaches it's ending up on. We don't know if it's on the sea floor, on the surface, where it's going, how long, how it's moving. Wow. And how can you solve a problem that is 99% missing? If, if a doctor said to you, you have cancer and 99% of it is somewhere in your body. We don't know where it is. Where does the surgeon start their treatment? Mm, um, yeah. And if 99% if of all the airplanes that took off this morning just went missing, that it would be chaos in the sky. And where do you start to, to search? And how do you manage that problem? Um, and that's the same thing. This plastic goes into the ocean and it disappears. So all of the, these volunteers and these technologies and these people doing ocean cleanups and so on, that's brilliant but you're blind, you're working blind. Hmm. So we're providing the data that maps where the plastic is so that they can go and find it. And then the second thing is the value of that plastic. Because at the moment we see it as trash hmm. and you take a piece of plastic and you throw it in, in the bin, in the trash can. Now, hmm. that, do you need to get that off? Oh, sorry. One sec. Um, just one second. Yeah, I'll give yeah. you one second. I'm working. Sorry. One sec. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, so um, that it, it doesn't have a monetary value, right? Except it does have an economic value and an environmental value. The environmental cost is, is so damaging. You know, the, the amount of water to make, it's like 10 liters of water to make, a one liter water bottle. Um, and the example that I use in terms of metaphor and storytelling is that if you went to go and buy pizza and it was 10 bucks for a pizza, fine, no problem. And then they say, they're just gonna hand you the pizza, like just loose. And they go, oh, sorry, do you want a box with that? And you go, well, yeah, sure, I'll take a pizza box. They go, okay, that's $150,000 hmm. for the box plus $10 for the pizza who nobody in their right minds nobody on the planet would spend 150 grand on the box for the pizza and if you had spent 150 grand on the box you wouldn't take it home and throw it away after you've eaten the pizza right, right. except that's the same ratio of cost as the plastic water bottle to the water in the bottle water is 0 0.0001 pence per liter the water is cheap and free people these companies coca-cola is not selling water they're selling bottles um, the water is is pennies the cost of the bottle is about a dollar fifty uh, on average globally so what you're doing is paying 150 grand for a pizza box and throwing it in the trash 
Now, you would never do that with pizza. That's madness. And yet we are all doing that if we buy a plastic bottle because culturally and societally, we have not been brought up to think of it in that way of the value of that plastic. Wow. Um, aluminium used to be the most precious metal on the planet. Aluminium used to be worth more than gold. The, the spire of the, I think it's the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, um, is coated with aluminium because it was considered more precious than platinum or palladium or gold or silver. And now we wrap our sandwiches in it and then we screw it up and we throw it in the trash. And yet aluminium still has a monetary value on the, you know, cents on the dollar that it's, it's financially worth us extracting that. So, you know, 60 to 70% of aluminium is recycled. It's pulled out of the waste stream and it's recycled. And if you buy an aluminium Coke can, drink it, that will be back on the shelf as a fresh new Coke can within six weeks. <laughs> so the system, the circular economy, the system to extract from the waste stream, remanufacture, repurpose, and go back onto the shelves is absolutely in place. It exists for other materials. And we don't need to mine for new aluminium constantly. And we don't need to have this devastating um, loss of aluminium leakage of this material into the into the oceans so what we need to do is is shift the value of plastic in our minds so that we understand it as being something that has a cost associated with it so in the same way you wouldn't throw away that hundred and fifty thousand dollar packet we're not going to throw away that plastic bottle it has to have a dollar value to us mm. um and, and that is going back to what we said at the beginning communication and storytelling and that connect connection to that, that material so that people don't see it as trash and they see it as a valuable commodity and a and a rich resource we had the oil rush we had the gold rush i'm waiting for the plastics rush when people realize actually i can get 300 dollars for a ton of plastic off the beach if companies were buying and they are starting to companies are starting to buy uh, ocean degraded plastics um and as the price of uh, recycling comes down and the technology becomes cheaper to convert these plastics and then the fines and the levies because we've got to have that as well we've got to have fines and legislation and taxes like a plastic tax if that goes up and the cost of recycling comes down there's going to be this economic tipping point at which point mm -hmm. plastic on the beach the trash is treasure it has a value and then they'll start paying people for that plastic and if you said it's 300 dollars for a a ton of plastic i can collect a ton of plastic off the beach in about an hour <laughs> if you said to me i'm going to pay you 300 dollars an hour the beaches around the world will be clean in a week you know <laughs> we'll, we'll get it all back into the economic system so as much as i i totally hate money and the way that it works you've got to play that economic game so what we're doing with ellipsis earth is providing the treasure map so that when that plastic tipping point when the economic tipping point comes we've got the treasure map for where the value of that plastic lies so that everybody will be able to go and clean up. Sure. We, oui. that is fascinating. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I just wonder, are you finding where this other 99% of the plastic is? Yeah. So that's, that's the bit that we don't know because, um, the, the 1% is what you can see on the ocean surface from satellites. That's these, I don't know if you've heard of these ocean gyres mm, in the yeah. center of every ocean, because oceans are like a kind of giant whirlpool. They're actually lower in the center, but like in a bath or a sink, as it swirls around, there's a dip. So the, the middle of the ocean, the Indian Ocean, the Atlantic, the Pacific, is several meters lower than at the coastline. So it's kind of like a little suction. And, and so the, the plastic collects in that kind of vortex. And, and we have these things called plastic gyres, um, which is this big sort of, Con a you know um, accumulation of, of plastic that represents less than one percent of of that all that plastic that comes in so the other 99 percent is either kind of floating in the top 10 meters as a kind of plastic soup like croutons floating around in this sort of plastic soup um, which is obviously really damaging for all the all the wildlife and the species that feed in that in that zone that's kind of the, the photic zone the zone where light um, penetrates and where you have all the coral reef and so on um, then we don't know what proportion of the 99% is in that section. Then there's the seabed, how much of it sinks to the seabed and gets trapped there and what damage is it doing there. Then it might be washing up on the beaches. And again, does it get washed up on one beach and sit there for a hundred years or does it move around and is it being entangled? Is it being eaten? 
a lot of it is going to be in the digestive systems of animals. So there's like 90% of all seabirds have plastic in their stomachs. Hmm. Um, hmm. Pretty much every sea turtle or whale or dolphin that's been caught has, has had some form of plastic in its stomach. So a lot of that is in, in there. Um, uh, and the difficulty is working out the proportions because that 99%, it could be like 98% of it is on the beaches and there's only a little bit in the ocean. It could be the other way around. We just don't know. So again, it's like, how do you tackle the problem if you have no idea where the distribution is and is it all of a certain type of plastic that's sinking and a different type of plastic is floating and is, is there separation that's going on so these are the kind of scientific questions that we want to know so acad academics and universities are really interested in our mapping as well because that helps them to model and um and measure the kind of to monitor the flow and the movement of plastic around the oceans um but yeah to at the moment to answer the question where is that 99 percent we don't know so, so, so basically, ellipsis hasn't um, uh, it hasn't helped identify where that is yet. Um, so we we we've done the UK coastline. Um, uh, we've done the entire length of the Ganges. Hmm. Um, we've done some of the Galapagos Islands and the Hawaiian Islands. We've done the, some of the US coast. We've done some of the European coast. Um, we've we've been sort of training the algorithm and trialing and getting to the point where it's working. So we spent three years in R and D doing all of that because the algorithm is only as good as the training data that you feed it. So you have to train it like a puppy and reinforce yes, no, yes, no a hundred times. And then it, it learns for itself. So now the algorithm is fully autonomous and it's working at a really high degree of certainty. Hmm. Um, and it's really, really brilliant. But what we now need to go at, and do is say okay now we're going to go and map so we've started mm. um we've definitely started mapping and we have heat maps for the uk and the ganges and about five other sites and it's kind of shocking um mm. for me that it's interesting the proportion of fishing net and bottles and then the other thing we're doing as well is identifying brands uh, specific mm. brands and that's really powerful because then you can go to those brands mm. and a lot of people are interested in in our work so um Greenpeace, for example, wanted to have our data because they want to go after Coca-Cola. They're like, they've got Coca-Cola in their crosshairs at the moment. It's their, it's their big thing. And they're like, we're going to take down Coca-Cola. But for me, I'm not about David and Goliath and fighting and saying, we're going to, we're going to name and shame. I am absolutely against naming and shaming. I'm about that collaboration of let's meet in the middle. Let's find a common ground, understanding and work together to help. So I would rather go to Coca-Cola and I'm, just using them as one example, I'd rather go to those brands and say, hey, look, we've identified these, this map. This is where all of your bottles are. Let's work together and we can help you clean that up. And then how good of a PR story is that you've got ahead of it? Don't wait mm. for everybody to attack you and say, you're terrible, you're polluting the planet. Why don't you get ahead and say, hey, we, we're the problem. We're a big part of the problem. We, we accept that. So we're investing $20 million a year for the next 10 years we're going, uh, our mission is to collect every Coca-Cola bottle on the planet and we need your help and we're going to pay you to do that or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. and, and you, you spin the story and you make that a positive collaborative effort of like, wow, these guys cleaned up their act literally. And that's amazing. And we can help them yeah. do that. So I'm taking what a lot of people see as negative data of like, oh, so you're going to find out who's the worst. And I'm like, no, no, I'm going to empower people to take responsibility and to provide um, the data that's objective and, and comparable and you know non-emotive I'm going to take that data and provide them the ability to everybody to put in their skill sets so you know whether it's they one company provides the funding and then the NGO provides the, the logistics and then the technology companies provide the cleanup efforts or whatever it might be but all the stakeholders involved can use the same data set that is absolutely objective and you know non-biased mm -hmm. so it's kind of a scientific approach to um nice. at the moment at the moment the only data we have about plastic is purely anecdotal because it's like brenda on a sunday who walks her dog on the beach and she's like oh i've seen a lot more plastic bottles mm. in the last 20 years nobody nobody unfortunately there's so many amazing volunteers and they go and do these beach cleans and they're wonderful and we need them there's like ten thousand volunteers who go and do these beach cleans and they're great. And we, I'm not saying we should stop doing that. But the governments, the, the House of Commons, the House of Parliament are not going to listen to that for legislation. Mm -hmm. Coca-Cola is not going to listen to that for, for putting money to, to clean up. What we need is objective scientific data that you can't ignore. And we have a million data points. So 
we they can't say that's an anomaly or that's only mm. it's like no this is the objective fact this is the map this is where it is you you know we're shining a light on it it's not missing anymore we found it what are you going to do about it or let's mm. let's help let's work together um so i think that's that's important and we get into that point and um nice. because i've i've very careful i've been very careful to frame it in that way i don't want people to see me as like some kind of vigilante plastics hunter um and i don't want these corporations to see it as a name and shame i've been very clear about that from the mm. start and so i'm going in and talking to we've got big names coming up we've got meetings with um all of the top all, all of basically the top 10 companies that you can think of are wanting to work with us and that is what i was keen to to do and that's what i did so far is doing so sure. cool man congratulations with that thank you. yes thank yeah. you it's really, it's really powerful and impactful. Like, and it's just, uh, yeah, it's wow. I mean, it just sounds like you, you're going to, you know, you're sort of at the start now and you're just going to make such a big difference, you know? And I think, uh, like I, I love, I love your mindset in terms of how you, mm. how you try and how you will spin it, you know, from like this mm. sort of, like you said, negative data yeah. into kind of like a positive message. And, and that's it's, really yeah. powerful. It's so and they can say, yeah, we've got an opportunity to, you have an opportunity to, to make a difference now to big company X, yeah. Y, Z. Absolutely. And they're like, cool, jump and on board. What's wrong with that? You know, people, uh, people were talking to me when I made a film about palm oil and they were like, I can't believe you included a scene from the, somebody from the palm, palm oil industry. And I was like, their voice is just as important and they have the money to make the change. Like, don't alienate them. Mm, they, yeah. David and Goliath is a one-off story. The small person doesn't normally win. Let's work yeah. with these. And also a corporation is not a big, bad, evil corporation. It's thousands of individual people mm, who all course. have families and homes and they need a salary. And especially in countries where actually they're providing jobs for, for you know, who are we to go in and say, you can't work for these people. I think it's very arrogant of us to, to do that. So, um, I've always said you've got to work together and if these guys have the means, they have the motivation from their reputation and from a PR marketing point of view, they have the motivation, they have the means, they have the access and they have the ability to do it globally and very quickly. Why would we sit there, you know, hugging trees and complaining when environmentalists should be working with the Shell and the BP and the Coca-Cola and like we should be working with them and they should be working with us and it is happening and it's great. Because I've always said with documentary film, my approach to storytelling and film is the same. I watch a lot of documentaries that I call, I call them super mega death tornado. The world is ending and it's your fault. And you watch those documentaries and there's, there's loads of them. We all know, you know these sensationalist, fear mongering, terrifying and the credits roll and people leave the cinema or they, you know, they switch off their computer and they feel helpless they feel scared they mm. feel angry they feel disgusted um they these are all negative emotions and those emotions firstly they're temporary um because we can't hold those emotions in our bodies for too long like we can't if you get angry or scared it, it's sort of come you know you just can't sustain mm. that and secondly they're divisive emotions because it's like well i'm angry it's your fault and then people start pointing blame and they retreat into opposite corners and that is not the way to get things done because people just start throwing stones, throwing the blame and everybody, or, or they just become apathetic. They go, oh, it's, I'm, I don't like it. I've had enough. It's too scary. I can't cope with it because you're being told you have to switch off your lights and you have to change your way. You, you have to be vegan and you have to never drive mm. a car again or take a flight again. And you have to completely change fundamentally who you are and society has to change. But you also are a single mother of three children and you need to feed your kids tonight. And also you've got to pay your council tax and your dishwasher's just stopped working. It's like, we mm. can't handle that. So people just shut off. So instead, I, I want to take that same energy because those emotions are very powerful. Guilt and fear and anger and disgust. Mm. They are powerful, strong emotions, but can we convert them by telling a positive story and saying, hey, these guys in this country are doing this initiative and my God, it's working and it's brilliant and it's inspiring. And take that anger and make it passion and take that fear and make it hope so that people are still connected and engaged. They feel it just as viscerally, but it's an active rather than a passive emotion. And it means that people come into the middle of the room rather than retreating to the corners they're like hey mm. this is amazing i want to hear more can i join in i like and they get this fomo of the credits roll at the end of that documentary and they're like i need to go sign a petition i want to join how do i get involved how do i and i, I get people emailing me be like 
where do I buy a water bottle from? And like, where do I get a bamboo toothbrush? And they want to be part of it. And that is what communication can do if you make it positive, but keep it powerful. You can create communities which are stronger than individuals and you can create movements that, 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 that fundamentally changes how we live. And that's what we need. We're not going to get it by blaming and arguing and telling people off and saying you're a terrible person because you eat meat. What we're going to be doing is creating these communities where we can support, share ideas, and people that are scared can hold the hand of somebody who's been through it and say, look, come with me, I'll show you how I do it, and maybe that'll help you. And so it's the same thing what we're doing, what, that we're doing with Ellipsis. It's the same thing that I apply throughout my life is kind of just be kind and be open and help other people and come together and meet in the middle of the room. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> Last little monologue there. So much, so much value. Right. Thank you. So no, 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 no. Like, like really like, you know, it kind of makes you just sort of sit back and like, wow, it's, it's really important to, to do everything that you said. And it's uh, mm. so great that there are people out, out there like yourself that are, you know, care so much and, and want to make a difference. Mm. So, so thank you so much for that. Um, but uh, I, I guess just to, to maybe kind of bring this home and, and you, you've probably touched on it in so many points already and just the way you've told your, your story and everything that you've been through. Um, what are like two bits of advice that you could sort of uh, give to our listeners that have kind of helped you in your life or, you know, or, or two bits of advice maybe to, to kind of make the world a better place in the future? So, something along those lines. Mm. Oh, that is hard. Well, the first one is probably a little bit counterintuitive, but I'm going to say it anyway, because it's my mum's advice to me, which is um, if you ever have a choice between two options, always take the riskier option <laughs> and just go for it. Because if it goes badly, you've learned a lesson. And if it goes well, you've ended up further than you thought and you've done something amazing. And in the same vein, you always aim for the top, aim for the, the, the moonshot. Because if you, if you fail, you're still just one rung of the ladder down. You're still higher than, than you expected. Um, so I'd say that in terms of what we've talked about, being adventurous and pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone. Always take the riskier option because it makes your life more exciting. And you might get some amazing results. That's the philosophy I have always when I have two choices. Um, and the second, I think, would be about around sort of human compassion and kindness, similar to what we've already said, is that you, we exist internally looking externally um, and we see other people without realizing necessarily that there's a whole world going on in that person as well. There's a German word for it, the realization, the overwhelming realization that everybody else's lives are just as profound mm. as your own. Um, I can't think of the word some long German word. So kind, yeah, uh, that as well, yeah. um, and you never know what's going on in someone else's life. You never know what kind of a day they've had. So if somebody pushes past you on the, on the underground or if somebody snaps at you, don't judge them for it and think, oh, well, that person's a terrible person. And I am guilty of doing that. Um, you don't know what else is going on in their life. So extend compassion and kindness to them and listen. And um, because you might hear something in between the lines. And that, as I said before, brings us closer to that, that common ground and that the middle of the room where you can have those really meaningful and productive, um, sustainable conversations. <clears throat> so yeah, take risks and um, be, be compassionate and kind. Thank you. That's uh, listening between those lines is so, so true. And, and yeah. well, there's so much when we listen to this conversation again, and there's going to be so much between those lines, that's for sure. And, and so, Ellie, what, what are you excited about moving forward into the future? And, and also off the back of that, um, what have you got coming up? And then maybe you can also just yeah. tell our listeners how they can get in touch with you and Ellipsis, Ellipsis Earth as well. Sure. So um, I'm heading out very shortly to uh, the Seychelles. I'm going to be uh, documenting and storytelling from the Necton mission, which is the, the deep diving submersible. So we're going to the deepest point of the Indian Ocean to map and track uh, sea mounts, which are underwater volcanoes, underwater sort of structures, which are the most biodiverse, rich places in the world. Mm -hmm. Sea mounts can be 
half a mile apart and have completely different species on them and a thousand new species on each that are not found wow. anywhere else in the world. So a bit like what we were talking about with the jungle. I mean, who knows what kind of information, what kind of medicine, what kind of species, what kind of technology. Um, they're also at like 4,000 meters deep. So there's no sunlight. Hmm. So there is energy production down there that we don't necessarily know um, much about. So it's a bit like going to another planet. So that's going to be fun. And then I'm going from the deepest part of the Indian Ocean to the northernmost part, um, uh, northernmost live broadcast. It's something I'm really proud of. Um, northernmost live TV broadcast in the world from the Arctic. And that is an educational broadcast channel that I produce, I field produce all the live shows for, where we bring real science, real time, live scientific experts into the classrooms and give kids around the world the opportunity to ask questions direct and live to polar scientists or coral scientists um, around the world. So that's uh, two very different types of storytelling. And then for ellipsis, we are looking at um, yeah, mapping the world, essentially, in a, in a nutshell. Uh, but we're going to continue building our baseline data because there is zero baseline. So we need to gather imagery um, from around the world and start to populate our heat map and working with these partners, having those conversations to really uh, grow this to a global scale so that we can have those real time heat maps that people can then use to inform legislation and behavior change and you know, give, that, give that tool to the world and public, mm. you know, publicly um, provide that as open source data. So it's gonna be a busy year coming up. If people want to follow me, they can do, I'm at Ellie Worldwide on all social media and you can go to ellipsis.earth or elliworldwide.co.uk um, and sign up to newsletters and subscribe and follow me and so on and I post all kinds of updates on there um, and awesome. please please do um, get involved I've, I've got all kinds of um, recommendations for plastic free products as well I'm a, an ambassador for a few different brands of amazing uh, companies that are producing plastic free toiletries or household goods or clothing that kind of thing um, and those are the people that we need to support we need to boost the market share of those so they've got the capital funds to compete with the big guys so um i've got discount codes and all kinds of things if people want to get in touch with me a little plug there um to cool. support those guys wow that's a, <laughs> an exciting future that you have coming up that's for sure chief yeah. as those trips sound incredible so um can imagine you're really looking forward to them um and yeah. just just our our last question ellie um mm -hmm. What does being ridiculously human mean to you? Oh, God. Um, that is a hard one. I'd say two things. One is, a, one is a big existential thing and one is a very small literal thing. Mm. The, the big existential thing is um, I, re I read a book called uh, Supernormal by Meg Jay, which is amazing. She's a clinical psychologist about children who have suffered through uh, trauma in their childhood um, or through any kind of deprivation or, or neglect or abuse or or just had a really tough time um, tend to grow up being um, what's called super normal people so that they are outwardly very empathetic and very caring and they go out like a big ball of fire and save the world and put a lot of energy into other people um, and um, I work with a lot of people who I, I think are like that who you know we've we've seen the value of connecting with other people and need that nourishment ourselves potentially um, to kind of cope with the the grand existential crisis of what are we all doing here and if you start thinking about the universe too long it's a a little bit overwhelming so it's like just go out do whatever we can to to leave a legacy and to make an impact and the second thing i'd say is being to to be ridiculous to human i see it as being alive in every sense of the word um and that is from being very aware of raindrops on your skin and the taste of fresh air and the feel of sand between your toes to be um present in a way that you've never felt before and to try and continually achieve that through that intensity of listening through that intensity of connection on a deeper level with people um, I guess being ridiculous to human means to me accessing the best parts of your humanity and 
connecting to that same in other people mm. um, rather than just existing in a in a shell of a human form hmm, love it that as many people do very much so <laughs> what, answers, what, what, the, the, what does the, everyone the, else say uh, there's <laughs> just such a such a mix to be honest with you like there's there's obviously there's no it's everyone's kind of like you know on the spot sort of answer and i think they're all yeah. being amazing they're all they're all amazing yeah. no, no, it's, <laughs> no that no, was no. great it that was, was really amazing good. it's very very powerful like you know there's, there's so many amazing answers and yours is just one of them as well so and we love the existential yeah. ones yeah ones. yeah we, we, <laughs> we love that side of things that's yeah sure. i don't i don't really know any other way to be yeah that's yeah good so, yeah well, thank wow. you Eddie, I just wanted to say, like, I, it's, I don't actually know where to start, to be honest with you. Like, what an incredible conversation and, and what an, like, an amazing lady you are. Like, uh, you, you're, you're probably the, one of the most self-aware people I've, I've kind of ever met. And, and, and that's, really? that's probably a lot to do with the, the, all the traveling that you've done and, I guess, mm. the connection that you have with nature. I think that is, that really kind of, like, makes us see the world differently, but also makes us mm. see ourselves differently. You know, we, we mm-hmm. it helps us do a lot of that inner work. Um, m- maybe not sometimes on purpose. Maybe it just, it just comes sort of naturally just by the environment that we're in. Um, and this... The, the 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 storytelling is so, like so evident in in everything that that you do you know like just i uh, obviously in in all the films and everything you produce but also just in like how you answer a question and mm-hmm. i think that is so amazing like it's it like it really engages the listener and and that is super oh, powerful you. you know and i and I, I was literally like you know for two hours I've just been sitting here like kind of mesmerized listening to you. I was like, this could carry on for the six hours, like you mentioned at the start. <laughs> and, um, you know, I can only imagine that you have such a big influence on the people that meet you, you know, and, and through the mm. events that you hold as well. So I'm, I'm really fortunate that, uh, we've had this kind of brief interaction, I guess, in the whole existence of the world. Mm. And I'm really, really mm. excited. Um, and you've given me this sort of like great newfound energy and, and just kind of like vision of the world and, and kind of what we all should be doing and contributing. So, you know, thank you for that. And oh, thank you thank for you. every everything that you do. Like you, you're a really incredible lady and, and you know, the, the business that you have started is just, wow, mm. it's like mind blowing and, and everything else that you do is just like, uh, just thank amazing. You. So, so thank you so much. Yeah, and, that's kind. Um, it's been really amazing having you on the show. So oh, thank you. Thank you guys. I'm, I was blown away to be invited. I, I was like looking at the guest list that you have and I was like, have they got the wrong person? Like why, are they, this isn't, <laughs> you know, I suffer a lot from imposter syndrome, so it's good to have that kind of feedback. Um, mm. But, but like what you guys do is amazing. Like it's, so, it's such a cool format. It's such an, um, a novel approach to interviews and to, you, you know, your, your, choosing people that are doing cool things that have impact or meaning in the world as opposed to just like oh this is a celebrity so we're going to talk to them you know and a lot of the time people that are on podcasts don't really have anything to say um Mm. so i i love what you guys do i think it's amazing i I think it's great that you're that you're doing it and and, um yeah thank you so much for the opportunity and the the platform um because i do i do want to have an impact in the world and i do want to you know make people think differently and 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 teach people how to see things the way that that i see them or the way that other people see them that has meant something to me so um giving giving me the the opportunity to ramble on too much as i always do um and apologize for is uh it's really meaningful so thank you you're gonna have fun editing that you know (laughs) no we will uh no but thank you There, there was there was so much in there and just real briefly from my side like First of all, thanks for recognizing that in, in that in us as well. Like that's really what we we are trying to do as well, and just um, and, and that's why that imposter in you should definitely vacate the premises because you you certainly <laughs> adding so <laughs> you adding so much value. Um, it's ridiculous actually, just what you're mm-hmm. doing and by example. And you know, I can just imagine sometimes you're sitting there all alone in on this adventure, and yep. it's it's quite crazy to think that you know. And but but. But in doing so, someone else is is going to see this now and go like, "Wow, that that's something that that even one person can make the difference." And I, what I really love, two of the really big things that I love is that you've got this scientific brain, 
and mm-hmm. it's, it's quite a, a substantial size brain you have, but it's still, <laughs> you're still connected with like this, uh, this EQ that you bring and a connection with yeah. nature and like, you know, there's sort of a little bit of the, the spiritual esoteric side of things. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah. But I love Which that, you know, that's it's nice don't... to be at your bridge. Yeah. And I'm in the middle, which is, again, it's quite a lonely place sometimes because the, all the spiritual hippies are kind of like, well, you're far too scientific. And then yeah. scientists are just like, they don't want to know. Um, yeah. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to blend both sides and understand, understand different ways of looking at the world. So it's, um, it's really cool to talk to you guys because I, I feel like I could kind of venture into those areas yeah. without being um judged and that's that's really amazing to create that kind of safe space for your audience to um but that's what you said the middle of the room we have to find those places we have to find these spaces when we when we speak to one another otherwise we just end up in our silos worse than ever before you know the the scientific the scientific community is a major silo and it's the scientific elitism is so awful Mm. and there's the the idea of like the public and science scientists it's like scientists are people too and they are the yeah. public and then also lay expertise like with these 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 um these people in indonesia who know the medicinal herbs it's yeah. like the lay expertise or public experts are so important and so valuable and yeah. then scientists in their little ivory tower behind their closed doors with their lab coats on is so damaging and it's kind of like bring the scientists out and bring the people with the knowledge together and that's kind yeah. of what i like about it it's what does future. um what does being ridiculous to human mean to you guys? <laughs> so uh, for, for me, I, I feel like as humans, uh, we really need to back each other more. Mm, and okay. if you can, if we can trust each other, then I think that is going to make a massive difference. And, but I think you build trust through storytelling. And yeah, so for me, it's having each other's backs. And because we don't seem to have enough of that, you know what I mean? We, we kind of all on our own missions. A lot of the time we, 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 we don't really, um, yeah, I don't know. We don't, we don't really kind of seem to trust each other enough. You know what I mean? Mm. Like, but, but Mm. if we can build that trust and we can have each other's backs, we can really change the world. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, We're we're constantly fighting the biological survival instinct of, you know, being selfish, um, which is a chemical biological primitive urge and yeah the idea of supporting each other is so powerful i love that that's really Mm. cool and i think just off the back of what gary's saying i just feel that we are of the same piece of cloth all of us you know Mm. and and we 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 really are connected on such a like a deep level that we Mm -hmm. it's actually ridiculous to me that we are so um you know, so tribal still and and, Mm. and all these little Mm -hmm. things about life, Mm -hmm. you know, so just having that openness and, and having a a bit of candor about our, our existence. That's so brief. And if we, if we can do that, we, we in a much better place because we can go like, you know what, we're all literally just all in this crazy ride, you know, stop taking yourself so seriously. And I think that's where we're, you know, have you guys, have you guys, been on your own podcast have you done each other <laughs> you have yeah, yeah it was, it was really a really great cool. experiment yeah, yeah for both yeah. of us i loved it yeah that's amazing because you you have your own incredible stories and your amazing approach and you're you're very inspiring so, <laughs> thank you uh, that's I'll kind of you to say those. i have to find those and listen to them <laughs> thanks <laughs> very much yeah. we, we still want to go a layer deeper on them at some stage we're like that was yeah. the yeah there was one and you know like you said earlier there's so many there's so many layers that and ways to uh, to tell a story, even your mm-hmm. own story, and then your own story through your, a certain lens at a certain stage mm-hmm. of your mm-hmm. life will be different down the track. So it's quite yeah. fascinating how that changes, you know. Yeah. So, um, yeah. but thanks for your thanks so much for your time today. We we really no do worries. appreciate it. No worries. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air, stop at the toll, digging.